morning and welcome to what is in theory a sunrise safari, although on this particular morning it is blanketed in a layer of cloud, a nice chilly start to our sunrise safari. For those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Jamie and in a strange and what could be thoroughly entertaining twist of affairs, we have the multi-talented Brent Leo Smith on camera with me this morning. James will be out on Rusty with Brian and we have the multi-talented as well, Kirsty and Jerry in final control. Welcome, we are coming to you live from Juma and Arethusa Game Reserves in the Sabi Sands of South Africa. And what an entertaining morning this could prove to be. Don't forget that we are also interactive and you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv and we'd love to hear from you. And let us know if you're a new viewer appreciate that and also not just that you're new but which part of the world that you come from we've got viewers across every corner of the globe and as a result we come and we probably have one of the largest safari vehicles on the planet our yesterday morning started off at a rather frenetic pace with wild dogs dashing across quarantine and then leading us on a merry dance throughout Juma Brent and myself and Andrew and Brian desperately clinging on to the back as we raced around. And from what we can tell, it seems as though there was a collision again two days in a row between the Sands Pack, what we think was the Investic Pack. The Investic Pack shot up to the north towards Manuleti. The Sands Pack went south onto Little Gowrie. And so I've decided it's time for us to do a little bit of a boundary check. I'm going across to Sydney's Dam now. One of the only sources of water at the moment in this particular area, so always a place that promises incredible game viewing. And us being live, you just never know what to expect around the next corner. The other consequence of the wild dogs, or part of the consequence of the wild dogs' presence on Juma, was that Karuna went south towards the Bulgari. Tingana had gone, I think, a few hours ahead of her. I think it crossed at some point during the night, two nights ago. So it remains to be seen if the two of them have decided to reappear. The Inkarumas have moved very far east, straight towards the Kruger. And for new viewers, the Inkarumas are lions, Tingana and Karula are leopards. I sometimes throw those names out without that you might not necessarily. <laughs> what has Brent spotted? Awesome. A pair of African hawk eagles. And that explains the guinea fowl alarm calls that I've been hearing as I was going around the corner. They are very well adapted hunters of particularly guinea, guinea fowl and you very often see them in pairs like this with one hunting slightly lower than the other and I've seen them on multiple occasions swoop down and catch a guinea fowl by a surprise you can imagine how the guinea fowl feel being fairly slow and clumsy birds when you've got a presence of an aerial predator like this but find the nearest bush to tuck themselves under and hide away. They can't really match the hawk eagles for feats of aerial skill. And the next best approach is to find a good hiding place. Definitely one of my favorite birds. And if you're hearing the whistling next to me, there's also a family of magpie shrikes that are chirping away making a fierce racket for the dawn chorus. So magpie shrikes, one of the many bird species in this particular area that are cooperative breeders. Very common to see them roosting together like this as well. All tucked away in trees. And this is the wonderful thing about my favorite time being out in the bush. Maybe that sort of gap between night and day and the birds are all up and calling performing their dawn chorus let everybody know that they have survived the night reuniting with the rest of their group and calling to other birds of the same species to let them know that they are here 
a little puffed up on this chilly morning. The white's a bit more visible than it usually is. Oh, some of you who've been birding for years might know them as well as long-tailed shrikes. And of course, with plenty of species out here, the names have been changed in order to basically to standardize the different names for the birds across the world. A lot of bird species, not this one in particular, but a lot of bird species are found in plenty of other countries right up, in the case of migratory birds, right up towards Europe and those northern areas. So you can imagine how people have come up with different common names in the past. And now there's a very strong attempt, particularly initiated by South African birding societies, to standardize common names so that we all call them the same thing. Still confuses me. I grew up with old bird names, especially the grey go away bird is one that gets me every time. I know them as grey luries. Haven't quite got used to that change. Come on, buddy. Everybody else has left. <laughs> You've all, you're all alone. This is slightly more reluctant than the rest of them to head out first thing in the morning. Okie dokie. Let's go see what Sydney's dam has to offer. And as I said, the multi-talented friend Leo Smith. Definitely a first for me, not a first ever on our live safaris, but a first for me. As we chat a bit about what we could potentially see, Daniel wants to know about an animal that we don't often see, but we do see. And that was, Daniel, you wanted to know why don't we see jackal on our live safaris? And the answer is, Daniel, there's actually just not that many jackal around here, but there are jackal. There's a side-striped pair that lives around the Arethusa airstrip that I've seen on one or two occasions wandering through. And generally in this particular area, because we've got two species of jackal, we've got the black bats and we've got the side-striped jackal. And in this particular area, the side stripe seems to be more common. I don't think I've managed to catch a black backed on camera yet. I think Brent, you have. Huh? Yeah. Brent has managed to put a black backed jackal on camera. I've only managed with the side stripe jackal, and in fact, my first time was a very <laughs> slightly embarrassing moment when I was sitting with a leopard and I saw something shoot across the corner of my eye and raced off in the thought that it was a wild dog and it turned out to be not a wild dog. And I had to eat some humble pie there. And then of course when we went back, the leopard disappeared, which was even worse. Hmm. All is quiet at Sydney's Dam. Just the odd hippo. And some water buck, I think, standing there in the corner. Well, Sydney's dam is quiet as far as we can see. Just those two female waterbuck and a one, two hippo, three hippo settled in the dam. I'm going to go and do a check of all of Juma's boundaries, see what crossed in or out during the night. We can build up a story of what happened while we were all sleeping. And while I do that, James is now out and he has some wildebeest to show you. Good morning, good morning everyone, and welcome to Rusty. Rusty, of course, a little bit recalcitrant at the moment, but seems to be functioning at the moment, which is good news. My name is James Henry. On camera is Brian, six foot three of him. Of course, we have Brent on the other camera, which uh, should be a fascinating uh, experience. I think he'll probably be okay. He has a fairly good eye. There is Brian's thumb saying hello to you this morning. And in front of Brian's thumb, of course, a breeding herd or nursery herd of wildebeest. Now, what I would like you to do, please, is count the babies and see how many there are. We had 10, I believe, at the beginning of the season, once they were all born. And there has been a lack of lion activity in this particular area. And that means, of course, that this herd has become much larger than it would normally. Normally, they have an attrition rate probably of up to 70%. But this year, it's been much better for them. 
So count up the youngsters, send us your answers at hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv and let us know how many wildebeest babies you can count. It is an interesting sort of feeling to the morning. Quite chilly, but 25 degrees and a little bit of precipitation coming out of the air. Mm, I wouldn't call it rain, I wouldn't even call it drizzle, but there is a little bit of precipitation, the odd drop on the legs. Uh, sand blaster, that's an interesting name. I um, wonder where you got it from. You want to know what time we get up and do we have breakfast before we go out on drive? Um, some of us get up, it's actually a sort of organized progression around the camp. At about quarter past four, uh, I get up, uh, Kirsty gets up around the same time. We normally meet in the kitchen where we put the coffee machine on. I go off for my morning constitutionals then. Uh, then Brian and Andrew, no, what happens next? Yes, Brent and Jamie then arrive next, normally with great fanfare, and they will then have their coffee. Some have a snack. Brian and Andrew sort of roll out of bed. What time, Brian? Half past quarter to five. Quarter to five-ish, half past four. Uh, Brian doesn't have any coffee. How he functions, I'm really not sure. He will normally have a snack of some sort. Today, a rusk. A rusk. Mm. Most of us don't have breakfast, though. We have breakfast when we get back at, to camp at about half past eight. So that sandblaster is the general morning routine. I can't function without my coffee, I must say. Right, I'm going to count the babies, too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight? No, nine. Ten. I think they're all still here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They're all still here. It really is fantastic. And they're doing well now. You can see some of them have got little horns. Well, they've all got little horns. They're all eating grass. They're fully weaned. And now, Andreen, you want to know how old these youngsters are. Andreen, the little ones are just about when were they born? Sort of end of November, mid, let's call it middle of November. So December, January, February. They're just about three months old, Andreen. Yes, that's correct. I thought I was going mad for a second there. Just three months old, already weaned. One or two of them might be trying to suckle. But that's going to prove very difficult with those little horns coming out of the top of their heads. Their mothers will not tolerate them bashing against the underside of their bellies as they try and get at the teats, because obviously that would result in a very painful injury. So they are eating grass at the moment. And milk is a thing of the past. And unfortunately for them, they were born in a very dry year which means that their first experience of grass is going to be a fairly distasteful one. Imagine their excitement if they make it through to next year, when I hope that we'll have some decent rain. Imagine their excitement at the new shoots of green grass that they've yet to experience. They'll be positively jolly, won't they, Brian? Mm. Hello, x -Ranga. You say you only counted eight young babies, but you were counting the legs and then dividing by four. Um, I think I'm going to put the error down. I'm going to count again just to make sure that I'm correct. The error I'm going to put down to the fact that you actually can't really see the full extent of what we're looking at, simply because, obviously, you're looking through the camera lens. So what do we got there, Brian? We've got one, two over there, three, Four. Good morning, Wildlife Station. That's five. Ooh, how many? Was there another one there? Three there. So we got six there. Then two lying down. Seven, eight. Nine just to the right of that. Oh, three lying down. Nine. And then there's another one just to the right of that, standing up, still having his breakfast. Ten. Here we are. X Ranga, happy? Ten of them? Very brave of you to start to counting legs and dividing by four. Now, of course, these are the same species that you see 
migrating in vast numbers across the plains of East Africa. That is a slightly different subspecies. It's called the brindled gnu. This one is not. This one is called the blue wildebeest, or, yeah, standard issue, blue wildebeest. And not the one in East Africa has got a white beard. So this one has a black beard. Even the ladies have got black beards if they're wildebeest. And in East Africa, the brindled gnu has got a white beard, or sort of palish cream one, depending on how much dust they've been running through. So they would be totally able to mate with each other, to interbreed completely. Hello, Cindy, in North Carolina. You're obviously something of an African safari aficionado. You want to know about Brian, sorry, but Cindy, I'm going to get back to you. Brian, there's a hyena just walking out of the pan there. There it goes, possibly back to the den site. Oh, a little bit of a fright or a hole. That's a lovely picture, actually. Cindy, you want to know about the sesame. And the sesame, you want to know if it's related to any of the other animals here. Is it related to a wildebeest? Is it related to something else, perhaps? They are relatively closely related to wildebeest, if I'm not very much mistaken. What I'm going to do is just ret retrieve this interesting little book that I have. And while you're looking at the wildebeest, I shall just quickly find the exact relation. They're not related to impala, for example. They're more related to things like hartebeest. I don't think that they're related to the hippo tragi, which of course are the roan and sable. <laughs> they are. Yes, they're part of the group called the Alcel mm. Alcelopini, hartebeest and relatives. Red and Lichtenstein's Hartebeest, Black and Blue Wildebeest, Sesebe and Blesbuk. And they're distinguished by their pedal glands, so glands between the front hooves only, and well-developed pre-orbital glands in front of the eyes, so they've got little glands in front of their eyes. Very nice question. Thank you, Cindy. So the Als... Al they're part of the Antilopini subfamily of the Bovidae. So the, the Bovidae is the family, Antilopini, the subfamily, and then the Alcelfini. I can't say that right. Alcelfini, 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 Alcelfini. The Alcelfini tribe. And, oh, I suppose some of you would like to see what a sesame actually looks like. I'm not sure I have a picture for you. It's rather an interesting looking creature. I'll just quickly check this book and see if there is a picture. If there is not, oh, I'll have one in my other little book. Wait, let me retrieve it with a great speed. You may also be able to hear a squirrel shouting in the background. I've stopped believing squirrels. That squirrel was alarm calling in precisely the same place yesterday afternoon. But we'll just have a quick drive around there. And if we don't find anything there, I'd like to go and have a quick look at the hyena den. Right, Brian, here is a sesame. There is the sesame, sometimes called a tetsabi, but that's by people who can't say tss, tetsabi, tetsabi. There he is, a very magnificent fellow. And these are the closely related antelope. There's the blesbok the hartebeest and the wildebeest, of course. Very nice. Nice question, thank you, Cindy. All right, while I head off to just check out that squirrel, uh, let's head across to Jamie, see what she's doing. I know she's doing a boundary patrol at the moment for leopard and dog tracks, and let's find out what she's discovered, and I will see you shortly. myself it could have been gently drizzled upon. I'm not sure whether that means we're going to actually get rain. I don't think so. I think it's 
looks just a few odd drops on a chilly morning. What that does mean for us is that I'm driving with my headlights on to try and be able to spot tracks that I might otherwise miss in this light. As soon as we get this cloud cover that blocks out the rays of the sun, this is usually the best time of the morning for tracking. The light hits those tracks exactly at the right angle and makes them shine beautifully out in the road. to our morning. I don't think though that it's going to be a proper rain. I noticed this morning that there was rain all across the mountains, which seems to be where it sticks. And since we've just come from Sydney's dam, Tom, who's watching in Dallas, has a map and is following us carefully as to where we go. Tom wants to know, is there another name for Sydney's Dam? And that he has Tamburti Dam on the map. Well, fascinatingly enough, Tom, you timed that, da that dam question perfectly. Because we're about to go past Tamburti Dam. Oh, no, we're not, apparently. We passed it. Oh, we passed the Booba Road. Never mind. Sorry, Tom. You asked the question at the right time because we've just gone past Tamburti Dam. I wonder if Brent is doing this frantically behind me. I sort of lost track of where we are on Buffalo, uh, on Buffalo cut line. <laughs> but yes, there's Sydney's Dam, which is closer to Gowrie Gate. Tom, if you have that on your map. It could be called Baobab Dam. It could be called Baobab Dam, yeah. And the camp around Sydney's Dam is called Baobab. And then you've got Tamburti a little bit further, directly opposite Mbubu Road, is where Tamburti Dam is. I have no idea if there's any water in Tamburti Dam. I don't think so. I would be surprised if there was. I haven't seen any animals around there. Looking like they've been drinking or mud wallowing. And for the most part, all of these man-constructed dams have dried up. It's only really Sydney's dam that still has water. And then some of the larger dams, such as Kaya Munzi on Buffalshook. And on our side, we've got the Juma and the Galago Pan. And then Treehouse Dam that is part of a natural, it's much more of a natural part of the sea plan than the rest of the dams. And still occasionally has water in it, particularly when elephants have gone and dug down deep into the ground in order to dig out some of the water. And a well-timed question, Tom. Lots of our viewers follow us on our maps. So, of course, have GPS trackers attached to our vehicles so that the ladies in final control can also get a rough idea of where we are. There's an interesting aspect to these man-made... There's an interesting aspect of these man-made dams up in the north. We've chatted about it quite frequently beforehand, and the fact that when they were constructed, it was a draw card for animals that might not necessarily have been in this area or have occurred in this area naturally, such as hippos. And we've spoken plenty of times, especially with the hippo that's been inhabiting the Juma Dam pan. Spoken a lot about the fact that it's drawn them here, and now, of course, with the drought and being unable to sustain the amount of water that we needed, it's ultimately resulted in a necessary intervention on the part of the management to actually remove the hippos and take them to areas where they will have better access to water. something on this knob thorn and we're seeing it uh, since we are chatting a bit about the drought we're seeing it more and more frequently these large knob thorns are taking a serious beating from the elephants and you can see they have completely stripped the bark and I'm fairly certain that that entire layer goes right the way around so thereafter the nutrients in the cambium layer which in knob thorns is a beautiful pinky red color and they strip away where the xylem and the phloem, so where the water transport and the food transport for plants, they strip that away and they eat it. And what that means for the tree, of course, is that, and if, being elephants, they don't always eat every part that they've pulled off. But what that means for the tree 
is that it will die. And I think I'm fairly certain that this tree isn't going to show much resilience. I don't even think it's got complete bark all the way up to the top. And so it will gradually, in the next few weeks, lose access to water for the leaves at the top and the food from that's produced by the leaves won't be able to reach the rest of the plant and it will die. And it will stay up for a while before falling down and knob thorns tend to come down fairly quickly, quite often, especially if it's windy. So they dig their tusks in and pull it off. And I've noticed it more and more in this drought, particularly the knob thorns around Central Road. This one's so been this particular tree has more bark to transport, so this one could survive. Interestingly, the tree that shows the most resilience in terms of surviving, there you can see where they've pulled and stripped away the layer, it's quite a dense layer as well. You can understand why elephants' teeth wear down in the way that they do. And keep your eye out as brain slowly pans up for grooves where the elephant's tusks have caused marks. I don't see any clear signs there. But very often you'll see gouge marks from where their tusks have gone in ever so slightly deeper. What's fascinating to watch is the way in which tuskless elephants will move behind. There you go, there's a nice groove that Brent has found. The way that tuskless elephants approach this, especially when they're with the rest of the herd, and they'll wait until one of the elephants has loosened the bark for them with their tusks before using their trunk to then strip away the patches of the bark. And tuskless elephants, of course, are something that is fairly naturally occurring, but in certain parts of the world has become more and more common in a very sad state of affairs. While we continue on the northern boundary of Juma, I believe that James has found a bird eating some turbines. Yes, I have found a bird, everybody. Its tail is sticking up, and there's its head. It is eating termites. Lots and lots of termites coming out of the warm chimney. Workers working away, soldiers trying to protect them, but in the face of that great orange beak there, there is just no chance that they can protect the rest of the mound from the yellow-billed hornbill. Now, going down into the mound, there will be millions and millions of termites. This is a very active mound, of course, and so even if that hornbill, and looks like it might, eats over 100 termites, which I suspect it will, it will make no difference to the numbers in the, in the mound. Well, obviously it will make some difference, but no appreciable difference. Just to the left of the hornbill is another hornbill. He's obviously still digesting. He's just sharpening his beak there, readying himself for an attack or possibly cleaning off the termite legs that are lining his beak. Magnificent fellow that he is. And then we talk very often about the ring-necked dove. Now, Brian, just above us here is a ring-necked dove, and it was calling so beautifully. It makes that call to some people alternately work harder, work harder, and others drink lager, drink lager. If you're thinking the latter at this time of the morning, you should possibly seek help professionally. See, you can see his little ring necked. And now the humble dove, there he's singing now. Isn't that lovely? such a quintessential sound of this part of the world. And again, I was just thinking as I stopped here, the last few mornings when I've been on so-called tracking team, the pleasure of driving out, turning off the engine, just sitting and listening for an extended period, surrounded by the sounds of the doves calling throughout the bush, has been the most wonderfully peaceful thing in the world just preening his feathers, making sure that all the filaments are correctly aligned, picking out oil there from the little glands just above his rump there, 
and lining the feathers with oil so that when he flies off, the humble dove, incredibly fast flying bird, I remember driving along once, I think it was a emerald spotted wood dove that was flying next to the vehicle. And I thought, well, let's just see how fast this thing can actually fly. And I think by the time I had to stop driving because it was getting dangerous, the dove was doing about 80 kilometers an hour. Now that's about 50 miles an hour. That's an incredible speed for a humble dove to be moving. And we tend to think of them as being fairly common and particularly unremarkable. They're very, very fast. And that, of course, is because they're eaten in fairly large numbers by falcons. We all know that a diving falcon can do more than 200 kilometers an hour, so that's more than 120 miles an hour when it's diving. Right, on we go. We're on our way to the hyena den. We're going to go via the Gallego waterhole. Hello, Jen, you're on Twitter. You're tweeting a little bit like a ringneck dove, and you want to know if it is the same bird as... <laughs> I'm sorry, Jen. Um, I'm not laughing at your question. I'm laughing, of course, because Brian has got an appalling um, case of hay fever at the moment, and in order to, to st stop in order to stop himself having to blow his nose while alive. He now looks like he's had advanced surgery in his nose. He looks like he's had septoplasty. So there are two large plugs extending from Brian's nose. Uh, I will try and ignore them as I tell you that the Cape Turtle Dove is, as you suspected correctly, the same as the ring-necked dove. Same bird but different name now for some reason because, of course, it does occur in areas where the Cape doesn't. So in South Africa it was called the Cape Turtle Dove, but you know, it occurs up into Zimbabwe and Namibia, it occurs in Botswana where the Cape is meaningless and so that's why in order to sort of standardize names throughout the place, it was changed to Ringneck Dove some time ago. Brian, they can no longer see me. There we go. And Brian is really struggling with dreadful hay fever at the moment. Jamie also uh, my sinuses are certainly slightly blocked as well. I think it's the dust. Not normal for this time of year. Of course, normally we don't have any dust now. We're normally driving through sloshy puddles. But at the moment, billowing clouds of unseasonal summer dust have created a situation where Brian has pushed three meters of blue paper into each nostril. Julia Smith, you seem to be appraised of some facts that the rest of us are not. Uh, you say, for anyone that doesn't know, Viam has left us. And uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that, Julia. Uh, Viam has not left us. Viam is just holidaying. And because of the Big Cat Week last, week, last year, our holidays have all sort of been thrown out of kilter. So some people have been on holiday, come back and gone on holiday again rather swiftly. Scott and Nikki are two such people. Viam is coming back, Julia, fear not. As we speak, he is hieing his way toward Johannesburg. On Sunday, he will climb in a hired vehicle and drive from Johannesburg to where we find ourselves now, to where Brian is suffering the effects of the dust. So he will be back, don't worry. Julia, your source of information is uh, perhaps a little bit suspect. I would be devastated if Via must have left us. Highly amusing man. Highly skilled, very technically savvy. Oops, this cannot be said for me. Well, the person, of course, who has left us this morning is, is Andrew. He's uh, having a little bit of a rest. Virginia, lovely question from Virginia. Virginia, in Virginia. I'm assuming Ginny is a shortening of Virginia. 
Uh, you want to know about pangolins, and do we get them here? Yes, we do get them here. Have I ever seen one here? No, I haven't. Have I seen evidence of them? Yes, I have. I've seen their dung. Stefan more accurately found their dung. I didn't know what it looked like, and he showed it to me. And so pangolins are found here, and there was extensive research done on pangolins in the Sabi sands at one stage. as a hyena over there eating something. Hopefully not a pangolin. What are you eating, you scavenging beast? Blood on the face. Jenny, I'll get back to you now. What is that, Brian? been stolen from something and it doesn't look that old either. Jenny, it's not a pangolin. Looks like a nyala. Hey, Brian? Yeah. What do you think? The remains of a nyala or bushbuck probably killed during the night. Now, I wonder what killed it. It may well have been the hyena, you know. But that is the very last pieces of it, unless it was killed by a leopard and then thieved. It's a female hyena, clearly lactating as well. I'm not sure from the, unless she turns and looks to the front, which one it is. It might be madam, actually. But I don't think Madam's got such scraggly ears on her back. We do think it's Madam from the final control. She does have a bit of a saggy belly. Yes, yeah, she doesn't have the belly of a ramp model. Hmm. So, I mean... Just quickly, I'm just going to quickly finish Jenny's question on the pangolin. Extensive research done on pangolin in the Sabi Sands. A while back, they are, seem to have a fairly healthy population number in the reserves, outside of the reserves, because they're so odd. And for those of you who don't know, pangolin is basically like a South, South African version of an armadillo. It's not related to an armadillo, but that's the nearest thing that I can sort of relate it to. A scaly anteater, it's also called. It's an anteater covered with keratinous scales that help to protect it. And it rolls into a sort of pill-like ball when it is threatened. Anyway, a pangolin outside of protected areas really struggles because they are, they're, they're so unusual. So they're kind of used for traditional medicine. Apparently they taste quite good if you eat them. I certainly wouldn't dare try that. They are rare, but I think they're okay here in the protected areas. They eat predominantly ants. In fact, I think almost 80% of their diet is made up of formicid ants. And so that is the humble pangolin. Very nocturnal, and that's why we don't see them during the day. So I, you know, spotted something in the bush there. Perhaps whatever it thieved this bushbuck from is still in the bush. Now, if it didn't thieve it, it almost certainly was thieved from a leopard. I wonder if the clan didn't perhaps kill it on their own last night. But you see the way she's looking into the bush like that? I wonder if there isn't a leopard watching her. I've seen Mvula have his kills stolen by a hyena in this area. Now, the last sighting of Karula was around here, but she was heading south at quite a speed. So I doubt it was her. Might have been her. Mvula does come into this area. Often when he kills, actually, he comes into this area. Like I was saying yesterday, these water holes are not a good place to be hanging around at the moment. You want to get in, have your drink, and move away as quickly as possible, because the predators know that the antelope and other prey species need to drink. Uh, 
See, she's, she's almost nervous to have a drink. I'm going to sneak slowly forward. Let's just see if we can't see what she's looking at. A female leopard, she wouldn't be worried about, but a big male, and she, with her on her own, while she wouldn't be worried about him, in, for, for sort of physically, she would certainly be nervous of him coming to take back the kill, and he'd be much faster than her, but he certainly wouldn't stand, try and stand her down in a fight. What are you looking at, madam? Thank you, viewers. You are confirming what the final control, and I think that this is madam possibly the matriarch of our clan. Well, we know where she's taking that. I'm sure she'll take it back to the den. Well, I'm not sure, but I think she might. I'm just gonna stop here briefly while she feeds and just see, scan the undergrowth here. For well, the telltale spots of a leopard. A leopard could be watching us from within sort of 10 meters and we wouldn't know. Right, shall we follow, Brian? I'm sure she'll go back to the den. Right, in fact, we can't go with her if she is going back to the den simply because that area is totally undrivable. So I think we might have to just go round to the den. That was going to be my plan anyway. So let's try and catch her that side. Terry, you also obviously a safari aficionado. I'm going to sneeze as well, Brian. Won't do to have me presenting with plugs in my nose, though. Um, no, she's moved now. Terry, you want to know about a striped hyena and whether we get them here. We don't get them here. They are largely found in East Africa, as far as I'm aware and their behavior is not the same as a spotted hyena. Spotted hyena has a unique social structure and unique behavioral patterns. None of the other hyena species have got the same way of living. They are all solitary or living in pairs and they forage in a solitary fashion and they're largely more scavenging than the, than the spotted hyena is. While the spotted hyena is a very good scavenger, they're also very good pack hunters. The rest cannot be said, for the, that cannot be said for the striped hyena or the brown hyena or the art, 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 um, art wolf, earth wolf, which is another hyena. Right, so we're just going to pop around via Vubu Road to the den, hopefully get in there in time to see Madam arrive. She might just take that into the bush and eat it quietly, simply because she's worried about whatever is in that bush there. And it might be worth going past there again, fairly, not too long from now, just to see if there isn't anything coming out of the bush. About ooh, two minutes away from the den, and she'll be walking straight through the, just where she went in there, there's a lovely path that goes through a wonderful sort of set of drainage lines that eventually lead into the drainage line that feeds the Juma Dam. It's the most beautiful place to go walking on this reserve, but trying to get a vehicle in there is not easy, and that's quite nice, because it means that there's always a patch of land there where it's undisturbed by vehicles. So that's one of my favorite places to go walking. Just listening to the radio. For those of you who are perhaps new viewers, we are in radio contact with all the other game drives around our immediate vicinity. Many of them are driving on properties that we can't drive on. But certainly if they come to this area, they'll keep us informed of any tracks heading here. And likewise, if we find anything of interest that they might want to come and see, then we'd call those in. I wouldn't call the hyena in because anybody wanting to see hyenas will come immediately to the den. 
But if they fire, if we found, say, tracks of leopard or tracks of wild dogs, we definitely just announce it on the radio and then okay. people can decide if they want to come and look or not. Here's a nyala through there. Now, Chris Rogue, you don't believe that that is madam. You've said so with a vociferous exclamation mark. Um, I'm tending towards your train of thought, Chris Rogue. I don't think, I don't remember madam having those scaffy ears from behind like that. So let's see when we get there. Here comes Taxon, he's coming out of the hyena den. He didn't see me. He's not going to be seeing any leopards. That's the level of his observational skills this morning. He just dissed. Kirsty says it's not that he didn't see me, he just dissed me. It's very unkind, Kirsten. Right, we're driving in along this, what is now something akin to a highway. Look, Chris, do you think that that, far from being madam, is possibly June's mum with the scar at the back? I didn't see the scar on the back, but you might be right. I'm, I, the only reason I would say that isn't perhaps correct is because that female definitely looks to be still lactating quite heavily. That might just be a combination of the fact that she has got swollen teeth as a result of many youngsters and a full belly. Right, she's here. Is she? No, she isn't. That is her. Is that her? Well, this, no, this is a different hyena. That hyena has definitely been eating because she's got a very, very bloodied face. I don't know who that is. That's an old hyena, hips sticking out. Chopped off left ear. Now that's Corky. That's our old pal Corky. You can see from the scars on the top of her head. The other one walking through the bush behind there, possibly running towards the arriving, the new arriving hyena. doesn't seem to be any baby activity here, which is depressing. Uh, Jennifer, I'm just going to sit here for a few minutes just to see if that other female doesn't arrive carrying the remains of whatever it was. I think it was a bush bug. And Jennifer, you want to know, wouldn't bringing the kill over here attract other predators? Um, no, it wouldn't, you know, I mean, these guys are so close to the predator, top of the predator hierarchy. I suppose it might, it could attract the attentions of lions. Let's just stop here. Could attract the attentions of lions, but you know that hyenas are so good at protecting themselves. The babies are so well concealed inside the mound that I don't think they worry about that too much. What it does do, though, if she's a low-ranking female, that she won't bring them the meat back to the den because she'll have that den, that meat stolen from her by higher ranking females. If she's a high ranking female, chances are she will bring it back, especially if, she, if she's got youngsters she's trying to wean on to meat. So that hyena that we're looking at now has definitely smelled something.
talkie has disappeared off. That's madam there, is it? Maybe I'm talking nonsense. No, it's not, that's Corky, sorry. Corky's waiting there. That's definitely Corky. The other one has disappeared off into the drainage line there. Thunder is rolling in the distance. Okay, I think we're gonna sit here for a little bit longer to see what happens, and while we're doing that, Jamie has got a much larger animal possibly closer by than this distant hyena, and I'm going to wait here for a while and see what transpires. I'll keep you posted. And look who we found, hiding in the bushes. Brent spotted him as we were driving along the eastern boundary. A beautiful old elephant bull, who is just as you came across onto this vehicle, decided to hide his head behind a bush. Let's see if we can get a better view from slightly further on a nice open gap, you should be able to see him. I know that we've all chatted about this before, the fact that recently we've seen more and more of these nice, large, older elephant males that have come in mostly from the east of us in Kruger, where all of the dams have dried up and they've pushed forward into the sort of Torchwood and Juma areas. Look at how sunken his, the gap is between his eyes and his ears and his temporal area. And that's quite a good indication of an old Ellie bull. And there's nothing quite like the sense of peace that watching one of these magnificent giants can impart upon you. I would guess at 40 plus. We really have had some stunning sightings. I know that yesterday James had the elephant bulls swimming in Arethusa Dam, wandering into Arethusa Dam, and then coming right up to the vehicle. And at this age, these gentlemen have quite a, a sense of comfort around them. They're just, they're very secure in, they're not nervous like young males, they're not on edge like the breeding herds. They know that they are one of the biggest things out here, which is why they're one of the most wonderful things to view, both from a vehicle and occasionally on foot as well. And you're fortunate to, enough to watch one of these giants. It's a very special experience. Hey, gentlemen. You're going to go hide behind the quarry bushes. set of tusks I've ever seen on a male elephant. Of course, there's quite a large genetic factor involved in that as well. Awesome. Here we go. He's been very obliging this morning. Here he's stripping the cambium layer, just like we chatted about before. Well, I think, in fact, this entire tree might go in his mouth. stripping away the top layer of bark, using those incredibly versatile trunks, their concertina muscles, and depending on how you count separate muscles, about 50 to 100,000 in that extended nose of his, with its finger-like protrusions at the tip, in such a wide range of motion. Interestingly, yesterday afternoon, well, yesterday morning, let's start with yesterday morning, we had an elephant bull on quarantine. We started off our morning like that, and then the wild dogs went to attempt to torment him for a while, we wandered through, and of course, elephants don't really enjoy the company of wild dogs. They don't seem to like the smell. And there's obviously some evolutionary instinct that tells them to chase them. They get very cross, they start shouting and screaming and running backwards and forwards chasing the dogs. In this case, the elephant bull that we were watching yesterday, I did have a look at Tara's sighting, Tara Piri's sighting from a while back, where she had an elephant bull right up close to the vehicle. And I had a double check and I'm fairly certain, I mean, obviously I don't know for absolute surety, but I'm fairly certain that it was the same elephant that we had yesterday around quarantine. And I would love to know 
with elephants, whenever I see an elephant of this sort of age, exactly how much they've experienced and where they've come from, what distances they've covered throughout their lives, and what kind of memories they have attached to it. You can see how comfortable he is, picking his way, trying to find the best approach to munching on that tree. I spoke about the sunken temporal region on this particular elephant and rewired port, I think is your name that you've sent through your question with. You were wondering why they lose bone structure as they get older. And the answer is just like any mammal. They start to, all, all mammals start to lose a little bit of bone structure. You'll see it in most of them, but it's particularly clear on elephants. They're, subcutaneous fat layer also decreases which makes the bones appear more prominent so it's not really that it's not massive bone loss in the same way for example you might have osteoporosis it's not like that mostly it's the skin's loss of elasticity and the loss of the subcutaneous fat layer underneath it that makes it appear as though it's sunken in always a little bit of bone loss with any mammal as the natural aging process carries on and of course his biggest aging factor and what will probably eventually lead to his timely demise will be wearing down his final set of teeth and at his age he will be right at that sixth set of molars and we've spoken about this plenty in the past the fact that elephants go through six sets of teeth in their lives they've got two molars on the top two molars on the bottom and those are regularly replaced throughout their lifespan at fairly regular intervals depending on how quickly the teeth wear down and there's a genetic factor involved in that as well some elephants teeth wear down faster than others but by the time they get to the age of this gentleman they're on their final set they're no more to replace them and as you can imagine eating all day pretty much all day eating bark and coarse foods it does eventually impact on the elephant's teeth and slowly his teeth will become less and less efficient and he will start to struggle to make the most of the nutrients of his food hello boy come and say hello he is gorgeous i love elephants Let's see if i can creep forward a little bit here he's going to come out Just let him hide behind that bush for now. I think he might walk right past us. We're just trying to work out where he might be going, if he's going to go and try and get some water. And as a bull, he will have spent the last... I would say 35 years of his life, oh no, sorry, that's not quite right, 25 years of his life, on his own for the most part, maybe moving about with other elephant bulls occasionally, but for the most part it's a solitary existence. Amazing how silent he is. Take some screenshots. We should be able to get a really nice perspective of just how tall this elephant is as he walks past this tree. I'll go and stand in exactly the same place at some point. I'll try and park in exactly the same place and I'll go and stand next to the tree. Our regular viewers are familiar with this process. Whenever we get a, an elephant bull of this size wandering along, you can do a bit of Photoshop or cropping or whatever technique you happen to use and superimpose it my picture onto where that elephant bull was standing and get a rough perspective of scale because sometimes it's quite tricky you don't fully realize how enormous these creatures really are and as he moves off to look for possibly water maybe some more appropriate breakfast we were just watching the way that he was feeding 
and the way that his trunk works. And Spotted Ozzy was wondering when he feeds like that. Oh, is he going to reach up? No, he's going to walk past it. Spotted Ozzy was wondering when he feeds, can he see the tip of his trunk? Or is there a bit of a blind spot and he feeds by touch? And it's a combination of both. They've got these incredible... They've got incredible nerves within their brains that allow them very effective proprioception skills. So they've already memorized the layout, but they will also use their tongue, um, their tongue, their trunk, to sniff and to explore the food options that they've got and really just do it by touch, plucking up the plants like that. They do, elephants do have a little bit of a blind spot towards the front of their heads and below their, obviously below their heads. They can't really see down there. It's one of the reasons I sometimes think that they get quite irritated by little animals moving around them. Something like a little Franklin. I've noticed they very often chase first and sort of stop at a, at a later point. And I don't know whether that's slightly to do with a, a slight blind spot. So they pick up on the movement, but they don't... Elephants are not entirely reliant on their vision. They don't have fantastic vision. Most of their senses are smell and, and hearing based. I just want to see where he's gone. I wanted to take the opportunity. Probably where the old wives' tale about elephants being scared of mice. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking about. And it's an old wives' tale, but they are scared of moving, little moving things. That's what's interesting about it. It's not really to do with mice. I think he's gone far enough. Here you go. Screenshot opportunity. I'm not going to shout back at you, so this is going to be a slightly silent segment because I don't want to be shouting across this distance. But you can get a bit of a screenshot and a perspective of just how large that elephant was. Regular viewers know the drill. It might be a bit of being a bit of a strange process for viewers joining us for the first time. You might be wondering why on earth I was doing something like that. But it does give you a really nice perspective of scale in terms of just how enormous these creatures are. So I'm five foot seven on a good day, on a tall day, when my posture happens to be as upright as it should be. It isn't always the case. But on a tall day, I'm five foot seven, maybe five foot seven and a half with these shoes on, possibly, trying to add inches to my height. Not quite the six foot three or four, how tall are you? Just under six four of Mr. Leo Smith, but even he looks dwarfed by these elephants in comparison. So what I've asked our regular viewers to do, for new viewers, is basically superimpose those two images and get an idea of just how tall I would look next to that elephant. The answer is not very. I'm gonna try and loop around one more time, see if he pops out on Gowrie Bay. And while I do that, and wave hello to Andrew from Cheetah Plains, let's find out what James has been up to. Okay, so there's another, a few things have happened. One's popped its head out there. One is approaching us now from the right-hand side. Corky, one of the Ds, and November were out. And then they've gone off, sort of just into the bush to the side where we can't go. And this one has just arrived now. I think, was that not the one that we saw? No, that was the one that we saw here earlier. It's not the one I don't think that had the kill this morning. So there's quite a lot of action going on behind the den site here. And not a lot, obviously, in the holes. So the D, the other D, that was the other D there, I think the, the, the one with the white patch, so the female. And here they come, here come the others now.
<laughs> so sweet. You can see the size difference there. So that's the November. That's November on the left. And now in front, of course, is one of the D's. Now, Justin, you're in Kentucky, and you want to know if there's anything that a hyena would be afraid of. Very little, Justin. Here comes another adult. Now from the side. Justin, the only thing that will worry a hyena is either a larger clan of other hyenas or a lion. And even then, even a lion, that's the one that's had the fight. Look, her neck is injured, but she's absolutely fine. You can see that that scarring on her neck is starting to heal. Mm -hmm. Wonderful stuff. So, Justin, yes, they will be afraid of lions. Remember, though, one or two female lions or lionesses will make very little difference to a clan of hyenas like this. A male lion, they will absolutely run away from. They'll be terrified of. Here come all the other adults now. This is a low-ranking female. So the one with the scarring on his neck is definitely low-ranking. The two, one of these, one of them's Corky, the other one I don't know, have come in, and now they're chasing her. Just seen her go running off to the right hand side there. We can't drive there, it's too thick. And she's moved off now. So she's obviously very low ranking. I wonder if those injuries weren't inflicted by her own clan mates. starting to really struggle to, well, I mean, I've always struggled, but to try and figure out exactly what go, what's going on here and who that is. Is that pretty, perhaps? Just with a big, fat, full belly after a night of foraging? I think that might be pretty. Corky is definitely the other one. Madam is not here. And for those of you who are perhaps new viewers, Madam is who we refer to as the matriarch. She's got very obviously notched ears. Then Corky has got those scars on the top of her head. She is mother to the two December cubs, one of which is the one you're looking at now. And if that is pretty, who I think it is, she is mother to November, who was one of the larger cubs that we were looking at this morning. Missing character characters include the scar-backed female and a number of males. Also, Madam's youngsters, which are two still spotless cubs, they're just black cubs, are obviously inside the den having a snooze. Unless she's moved them, but I can't see that she would have moved them with the others still here. Fascinating stuff. Now, while you were away, I also was doing a little bit of research into striped hyenas because I realized I didn't know too much about them. And striped hyenas occur, would you believe it, all the way through the Middle East into India and even up as far north as the Caucasus Mountains. So they have a very strong influence in folklore from north and eastern Africa all the way to India and up into the Caucasus Mountains but a completely different social structure from the spotted hyena. They are actually, quite interestingly, monogamous pairs where male and female help to raise the youngsters. And we get lots of questions about whether some of the hyenas are good dads or some of the animals out here are good dads or not. Normally the answer is an unequivocal no. Male mammals are normally appalling. When it goes to child support, that's not a bad thing here of course but 
the striped hyena is an exception to that rule. And I was just wondering this, and I think Chris Rogue is absolutely correct here. She says that, that one of the injured neck is a male. I would agree with you, Chris. I think it, that is indeed a male. Uh, not a very high-ranking one. Well, I mean, obviously, the males are all low-ranking compared with the females. None of them will have any rank compared with the females, and that's why he would have booked out of here at a great speed when the females came back around the corner. So the females, as most of you will know, are much larger than the males. They have a much higher testosterone level, much higher androgen levels, and that's for various reasons. We're not entirely sure as to why that's evolved, but probably has something to do with dominating feed at the kills so that they can then bring enough nutrient back to the den to feed the youngsters. And again, in the striped hyena, the male is much larger than the female. Now, Kevin Geyer, you're wondering about those little black cubs and whether they're still safe, given that we haven't seen them in the last few drives. Kevin, I would say that they're so little still that unless their mum is here, they will stay inside the den. That will change fairly soon. They'll start to pop their heads out, even when there are a couple of other low-ranking females around, and even when there's a sub-adult here left as a sort of nursemaid. But without their mum at the moment, because they're largely still suckling, in fact, they're definitely still suckling almost exclusively, they probably won't spend much time out of the den without their mum here. Look at that little thing. Too wonderful. So there you can see the little, you can see the little white, oh no, we're looking at a different one. They're both, both December cubs are now lying on the ground. We're looking at the young male. Now we know he's a young male simply because we've seen him with his penis extended as we have with his sister, who's the one with the little white tip on the left back foot. It always looks so exciting to go down into that hole. I would love to go. There's the one with the little white tip. You can see it on the back of the left hind foot. I've always wanted to sort of shrink myself and go into one of these burrows and see what's inside. I think many of us have wanted to do the same with rabbit warrens and rabbit burrows and perhaps even into termite mounds and ant nests. But I think what I'd find is that the smell would be insufferable inside there. The air quite stuffy. is peaceful. There are a couple of hornbills calling. The doves are still ringing their calls through the echoing through the drainage lines gently. And Linda, you're on Twitter and you are supportive of that male who was chased off and you say you don't think he was going to hurt the youngsters. No, I don't think he was at all. That really doesn't happen a great deal. The males tend to be completely subordinate. I think he was probably just hanging around here saying hi. And they will definitely come back to the den every so often just to kind of reaffirm their bonds. He very fondly greeted the youngsters and he allowed them to greet him. And then he moved off, of course, when the intimidating sight of Corky and Pretty came round the side of the mound. But yes, I would agree completely that he had no intention of hurting them. Now, Kristen, you're on YouTube and you ask a very good question and it's really difficult unless you're very practiced at it, and some of our viewers are. You want to know how 
Well, you can tell male from female given the, si the pseudo penis, which looks exactly like a penis. Now, for those of you who don't know, the spotted hyena is unique amongst mammals, where the female has got what is known as a pseudo penis, which is in fact an enlarged clitoris. And the sort of arrangement of the genitalia means that they look almost identical to males if you just look at the back end. Now, the way you tell is when they greet each other, males and females will extend their peni and pseudo peni. I'm not sure that's even a word, but I'm going to use it anyway. And they are different shapes at the tip. A male will have a pinched tip to the penis. A female will have a fairly straight end to the pseudo penis. Now, what you can see there is what's known as a false scrotum. So while that looks like a scrotum, it isn't. It is just a sack of fat, basically, that uh, forms over where the vulva would be. But there isn't a vulva on the, on the hyena. And she actually gives birth through her pseudo penis. And it's an incredibly complex arrangement that has very detrimental effects. And up to 18% of new mothers will die in childbirth because it is such a complicated process of getting a baby hyena out of the pseudo penis. So it really is quite complicated indeed. Nice question, thank you, Kristen. So I mean, if I see an example, you can definitely see it on the D1 and D2 cubs. So the female is the one with the, with the little white foot and the male doesn't have the little white foot. And when they are greeting each other or greeting an adult and they extend their pseudo and penises and penises, um, you can definitely see the difference in the shape. I don't feel one should say words like pseudo penis too often. It starts to make the face go red. Well, Maggie, M in Australia, you've been watching for a while, and you want to know, given the preeminence of females in the society here of hyenas, would a female be more likely to lavish attention on a female cub than she would on her male cubs? No, I don't think so, Maggie. I think it would only kind of start to, you know, the, the dominance would start to show fairly early on, but I think the mother will still be fairly protective of both. Although, remember that the male, of course, does not inherit his mother's status. He does within the male hierarchy, but within the actual hierarchy of the hyena clan, um, even a male born to a high-ranking female will be outranked by lower-ranking females. But I don't think the mother necessarily shows a preference to either. No, Maggie, I certainly haven't seen that with these two D-twins. It's just wonderfully fascinating. It's endless, endless fascination. Now, Donna, one, of course, the you, we were chatting earlier about the birth process and the difficulties thereof. And Donna, one, you want to know about the mating process. How does that work? And is it uncomfortable? I don't know that it's uncomfortable at all, but it certainly cannot happen unless the female is completely willing and receptive to the male because she's got to invert that pseudo penis to create the channel for the male to mount her. And because of where it's situated, she's really almost got to reverse into him in order for copulation to be possible. So I don't think it's necessarily unpleasant, but it's certainly quite complicated and cannot happen unless she really wants it to. That, of course, is largely the same for many of the mammals out here. Because of the way things are designed, if a female doesn't wish to mate with a male, <clears throat> she just keeps walking, and it becomes completely impossible for him to, to mount her. Yeah, you can hear the little ones calling now inside the den. And Anna Marie, interesting that you should ask, does the brown hyena have a pseudo penis 
or the striped hyena no it's only the spotted hyenas that have them the brown and striped hyenas do not have pseudo penile in the slightest they're completely as you would expect a mammal to be right let's head across to jamie get an update from her and what she's doing i think i'm going to sit here for another 10 minutes or so and then we'll move on and see what else we can find see you shortly James has had a fascinating time at the hyena den. Just bear with me one second. I'm just listening to an update from the guys driving around on Bookle's Hook, and it sounds as though there's a possibility that the wild dog could come back south. The investic pack disappeared up towards Manuleti yesterday, sometime in the morning. And by the sounds of it, they might be coming back south. There's two vehicles there tracking them. I think that will be our next plan after our Mwati drainage line tour. This is a beautiful spot to be in. Just give me one second while I respond. Copy that, thank you. I'll make my way into that area. our search efforts. I'm going to go back towards the Bubbleshook boundary and check all along there, back to where Tom asked the question about Tamburti Dam. That is exactly where we want to be heading back to. We'll have a look around there. And Joseph, you've asked a perfectly timed question as we drive through here. But I have to, you have to just bear with me one moment because I've got to answer, somebody's just calling me. Go ahead. Uh, negative James was there. I'm not sure if he's still there now, but it was active about five minutes ago. Okay, so, sorry. Joseph wanted to know about the age of the trees out here. And we do have some extraordinary looking ones from the giant jackalberries and bush willows to my personal favorites in this drainage line, some of the leadwoods. And many of these older trees, these larger trees, let me stop for one moment, we can have a look at this. Many of these older trees are close to, I would say, a couple of hundred years in terms of age well into the decades, if not the centuries. For leadwoods in particular, they are known to be long-lived trees. They're actually a protected species with their crocodile-like bark and their pale leaves. And they've done some carbon dating on leadwood stumps. And the leadwood is called leadwood because, as the name suggests, the wood is incredibly solid and very heavy. One cubic meter of leadwood wood would weigh close to a ton, so 2,000 odd pounds, which means it's very resistant to termites and wood borers. Even elephants very often give a leadwood plenty of space. They don't really debark them in the same way they do to the marulas and the knobthorns. So these trees can live, and they've done carbon dating that shows trees that have lived up to 500 years old, then died and the stump has remained for another 500 or 600 years. And I'm sure, I'm certain that there will be trees in this Mulwati drainage line that could be close to a thousand years old would be my guess. I would not be at all surprised. It's one of my favorite things about the trees down in these drainage lines. Definitely the best place on Juma to come looking for different and unusual species and some of the giants. Yes, leadwood and marula trees actually. You can't cut down marula trees either, but leadwood in particular, even when they've died, you can't cut them down. And you can imagine with a nice solid wood like that, how when people first started sort of industrializing this area, how appropriate, I love this archway. It doesn't come crashing to the ground. There you go. You can imagine how a solid wood that's resistant to termites and wood borers, how appealing that would be for people to make things like railway sleepers or use it for the construction of their homes. It's got to the point now because a, even a dead lead wood is an ecosystem, well, almost a little unique little ecosystem all in itself, with 
insects and birds nesting in the hollows. It's led to them being protected even once they've died. So you can't cut down a dead lead wood. You can pick up the pieces of wood that are on the ground around it, though, little twigs and logs, and it makes for the best firewood. It burns for an incredibly long time, and it takes a while to get going if you're looking at the thicker pieces, but once it is going, it produces really, really boiling hot coals that retain the heat because there's so much energy that can be broken down and converted into heat and light. And once you've finished with that, if you are so inclined and find yourself without any kind of, let's say, dental material, maybe you want to brush your teeth, if you mix the lidwood ash with a bit of water, it works as a really fantastic toothpaste. And if you combine that with a guari bush, which I'll find I'm not gonna, probably not going to encounter exactly where we are in this drainage line, but if you mix it up and you take a guari branch and you strip it down and you make it into a toothbrush, demonstrate that whole process to you. You can use that as a combination of your toothbrush and toothpaste for the evening. It's also been utilized, that ash has also been utilized as a whitewash. High, high in calcium. There are some extraordinary trees down here, all with their own different medicinal purposes. The Tamburti trees with their toxic latex that can kill a human being large quantities, but can also be used for toothache if you're feeling brave. Personally, I've tried it. I don't think it works, and I didn't feel very well afterwards. Not a process I'm going to be repeating. And the tremendous ancient and dark jackalberries. While we continue on our tour of the Mawati drainage line and the beautiful trees that we get to look at, let's pop back to the hyena den for one last glimpse of those spotted animals. Right, we're still here, everyone. One or two developments have happened since you were last here. The cubs all went off towards the hole there, and Pretty stood up, and I thought, oh, what's going on here? And then I looked behind us, and I saw a nyala, and the nyala has since absconded. It was just, oh, no, it's, it's still there, actually. It's just right behind us. We can't actually film it. It's just browsing quietly behind us, and the hyenas were watching it quite... Uh, intently. Now it's a big bull in Yala, and so while certainly a large clan of hyenas, or if there were three or four adults here, they could probably take it on if they got close enough. These two females, I think, would be wise to just observe him go past. I'm sure he must be aware of them here because obviously there is a smell about the place if you happen to have a sensitive nose. It certainly doesn't smell to me, Brian. Does it? Well, obviously, it doesn't smell to you. Your nose doesn't function at the moment. Um, you'll be relieved to know that Brian has removed the plugs from his nose. But Andrew said that this place really stank the other day. But at the moment, odorless completely. So what we're going to do, I think, from here is head to, along the Bifelswood cut line. So we'll go north and then east along the Bifelswood cut line. Apparently the wild dogs are heading in our direction. I'll be very fascinated to know if they come across here. If they do come across here, of course, that will just be the best thing in the world. I'm going to suggest, and Jamie's basically just asking if I want to go there, I think maybe we should both head in that direction, but I think that we will start to do that now. So, wonderful time with the hyena den. Thanks, hyenas. Let's go and see if we can't pick up on some wild dogs, which, of course, are, Brian, not related to hyenas in the slightest. Indeed. Can I find the remote control? Yes, I can. There we go. Right. Marvellous sighting. Thank you. Jamie is heading back to the Democratic Republic of the Congo to try and get a rain jacket. I think that she is being very, very hopeful indeed. I'm not going to get a rain jacket in order to try and tempt the universe to genuinely spit on us. 
There's the Nyala. Just see him feeding through the bush there. So he's not in the slightest bit worried about the presence of the second most terrifying predator in the predator hierarchy. I'm going to try and maneuver past this car here. I'm not sure who they are. Clearly from Beetle's hook. Apparently there's a static noise coming from my microphone. Check the batteries. Seem to be all right, Brian. Good morning. How's it going? Good. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Enjoy it. Cheers. Um, Kirsten, is there still a static noise coming from my mic? All batteries are fine. Yeah, not sure what the static is, everybody. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, I'm just going to get a quick update from the Bivols of Guys. We were following the dogs south to see how close they are to our boundary. Now, the reason I'm not hearing anything, of course, is because this is on the wrong channel, which is totally hopeless. Stand by. Stations with pack on Bivols will come in, please. Okay, copy. I think they were around hard to call. Do you don't have any idea? Um, did they head south from there? Apparently, it's just tracks. You would have heard Jamie. The cats and Ephraim are following us. They mentioned the separation dam, the possibility of them coming out that side. Okay, copy. I'll go up Uber Road and have a look around there. Okay, so the tracks were heading to what they call Tambuti Dam. Tambuti Dam is the dam that we're going to pop out on at the top of this road. Now, of course, wild dogs do not run in a straight line unless they are following something that is running in a straight line. They'll run all over the place. Go again. Um, up towards Sydney. So you can hear Jamie there saying that she's going to check the Voyatella access towards Sydney's dam, which is there. Tambuti Dam is just over here. Okay, copy that. But, you know, those dogs, if they find something, they'll turn, change direction immediately and run in another way. So I'm not going to get my hopes up. from someone called Love Three Dogs. Uh, there are a few more dogs in this pack, Love Three Dogs. So I hope you will find it in your heart to love all of them if we see them. Love Three Dogs, you want to know how long the drought is expected to last? We are unable to say. There was, was talk from the one of the sort of research institutes of the country that February would see quite a lot of rain. Well, we're almost halfway through February now, and there has been not a jot. So, mm, I don't know. Maybe end of February, but I suspect we're going to, we're in for a pretty dry year until at least the next rainy season, which will only be in October or November this year. There may be some late summer rains, but it's not going to make a huge difference to the grass sward, because the growth season is all but done. Right, this is Tambuti Dam here. You can see the dam there inside Biffle's Hook. I'm just going to stop here and have a little bit of a listen. And then we're going to continue towards Biffle's Hook Dam. And Jamie, of course, is coming in from the west of where we are. So she'll check between here and Sydney's dam just to see if the pack hasn't popped across to say hello to us. Right, I'm going to keep the radio quite loud, so if you do hear it, I apologize. But just 
in case something exciting happens. I'm also going to be watching the road quite carefully to see if tracks don't come across. And every so often, I'll just look behind us like that to see if I can't see them coming across. Brian, how's that nose doing? Oh, very well now. Ah, oh, much better, good. I'm very pleased that Brian's uh, nose plugging seems to have solved his problem. a very valid question. You obviously know that we live at a place called the DRC, which is um, not the Democratic Republic of Congo, of course, but the Juma Research Camp. And you want to know what research goes on there. Uh, none. At the moment, the, the DRC was so named, I think, during the course of, you know, of history, when certainly there was research going on there. But now it's occupied full time by Wild Earth. We don't do any research, we're busy making films, which I suppose is a kind of research, but at the moment it's not a research camp. It's just called a research camp. So I can see why Jamie is feeling a little chilly. It is quite nippy out today. Ryan, you've only got one jacket on. Oh, have a spare. You're going to have a spare. Sorry about that. The camera doesn't like these bumpy roads, so we'll drive very slowly along here. Just keep looking behind us. Right. Also going to be stopping and listening every so often. Beautiful flower here. While we just have a listen, you can look at that morning glory. Our variations of this flower, of course, are found throughout the world. And really nice little splash of color in what is a fairly, well, not depressing, but certainly, um, what shall we say, sparse landscape at the moment. Beautiful morning glory, Ipomoea species. Now, Joseph, you want to know where Juma gets its name from. Juma is one of the words used to describe a lion's call, and it is onomatopoeic. And you can hear, if you've ever heard a lion calling, not necessarily roaring, but calling, they go, oh, do, 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 do. Especially at the end of their call, if they've been roaring. Oh, that's the end of the call, do, do. Jorm. And that's where the word Juma comes from. Nice question. Right, we'll carry on driving along the road here. Just listening. Right, the dogs are not here. They're in front of Jakana Camp, which is still, not, still on Bivol's Hook Dam. At least yeah, I'm hook. coming back. Okay, so we're not going to see dogs at the moment. They may still head south. I'm going to find out if they've made a kill while I do that. Let's head across to Jamie, who's wrapped yeah, up in this Arctic to to weather, and I'll see you shortly. Well, there we go. I think James has probably just given you that update about the fact that they've located the wild dogs on Buffalo's Hook. But you never know on a cold and somewhat rainy day, as this morning is proving to be. Sorry, now I'm just listening to James chatting. Yep. Squirrel alarm call. Sorry, guys. Green's picked up on an alarm calling squirrel. Woodpecker. 
hear the woodlands kingfisher and a woodpecker tapping away. Somewhere fairly close to us. There's two of them. Squirrel? Squirrel stopped. Warbirds. Warbirds. Okay, so there's a small alarm calling. I think it was at a Warbirds eagle. Let me see if I can find those woodpeckers for you. I'm just listening with half an ear to the Game Drive channel because they're just discussing how close those dogs are to the boundary. Keep your eyes peeled for the woodpecker. Okay, wild dogs running straight west. So I think we're going to go try and intercept them somewhere around Sydney's dam. <laughs> Good point though. James Richards has said that he's not entirely sure. There's one picking down that way. Thought I heard one feeding around here. Keep looking. James Richard has said that he's not entirely sure that the vehicles could handle another wild dog sighting and they certainly work a bit harder than they might usually. We do some rather rapid paced off-road driving and some even faster on-road driving. Nothing like following wild dogs. That's why we're getting so excited, even though they're on Biffle's hook. And as I said, on a cold morning, there's a very good chance that they could be moving around. I'm just going to turn my game drive comms down a little bit. Our woodpeckers escaped us. Brent and I were just discussing being able to tell the difference between the different species of woodpecker. And there are quite a few that you can see out here between the cardinal and the bearded. just spotted a gymnogene being mobbed by what looks like a family of starlings. And I've noticed with the harrier hawks they're particularly shy in this area. They generally don't stick around. I'm going to try and get to that tree without it flying away. Let's try and raise the Awesome. It's currently foraging around the nest holes of the marula trees, which is why it was being met with such a discomforted approach the other bird species there you go you can see it in silhouette the african harrier hawk or a gymnogene a specialist nest raider and the starlings are not very happy the droggers are not very happy the rollers are not very happy everybody's joining in and diving and a lot of the, the rollers, the purple rollers and the lilac breasted rollers have nests on quarantine in these marula trees. I know of at least one purple roller nest. Try and get another view. And it's amazing how courageous the little bird species can be in defense of their nests. As we speak, the squirrel's now alarm calling as well. They're furious. Can you hear how angry they are? Whoop! Look at that. This is incredible. Look how the face is flashing. The red colour starting to flush in irritation at being mobbed and attacked. This is so cool. This has got to be one of my best harrier hawk sightings to date. Off he goes to the indignant screeches of the rollers. Had enough. Off to find slightly less well-guarded nest sites. Oh, lilac roller. <laughs> That's awesome to see. And those little bird species, the drongos and the lilac-breasted rollers, it's amazing what they will tackle and take on. Of course, 
they've got the advantage of their small size, it gives them a little bit more maneuverability in the air, which allows them to take that quite aggressive stance. And when somebody's raiding your nest, it makes absolute sense to try and chase them away. We've spoken before about the double jointed legs, or almost double jointed legs, of the Harrier Hawk and the way in which they can cling on with one foot and dig backwards with the other foot to try and reach into nesting sites. You can still see it there. It's going to, ah. <laughs> no peace for the Harrier Hawk this morning have to find a different neighborhood. And Brent's doing an awesome job and just proving how multi-talented he actually is. And while we chat a bit about the different birds and their maneuverability, Siberia Zumi would like to know, what is the bird with the fastest wing beat? So wing speed, do the sunbirds flap as fast as hummingbirds? And the answer is no, they don't. They don't flap to quite the same extent, and they don't have that tremendously rapid metabolisms that hummingbirds do. Honey, uh, sorry, hummingbirds, not hummingbirds, hummingbirds. And of course, many of you in North America, and we were actually chatting about this two days ago, will be familiar with putting nectar feeders out for the hummingbirds because their hearts beat so rapidly and their metabolism runs so fast that they need an almost constant access to food. Looking at the Oriole. In the silver class leaf, since we have got... Hmm? There we go, there he is, he's in the... Birds all over the place. Woodlands kingfisher calling, this is a black-headed Oriole. And it's been thoroughly cooperative for an Oriole. I've struggled before to get them on camera. The Woodlands kingfishers are all chirping away. All of the little birds in this area are disturbed by the presence of the Harrier Hawk. That stunning yellow color. One of the few pure pigments, that yellow color that birds have on their feathers. It's usually a combination of yellows and oranges, and then melanin, and the colors are all created by combinations and layering to produce the bright blues and greens that starlings or kingfishers have. Awesome, I'm just listening with half an ear to the Game Drive channel, sorry, bear with me. I think it's time we left our feathered friends It sounds as though, unfortunately, hello, Hornbill. It sounds as though our wild dog pack has just cut through the Buffalo's Hook Corner, close to Gowry Gate, and onto Manuleti. But I'm going to keep listening because, as you saw yesterday and the day before, you never know where the wild dogs are going to decide to go next. While we search for more wondered feathered friends, wonderful feathered friends, James has found another one to show you. A large raptor. I'm going with Wahlberg's eagle at this stage. Brian, what do you think? A Wahlbees? Hmm. Just doesn't have that crest at the moment. You'll see when it turns its head to the wind, if a little crest pops up the back of the head, and that will immediately indicate that it is a Wahlberg's eagle. It's definitely an eagle. We know that because it's got feathered legs all the way down to the vicious talons that it has clasped around the limb of that dead knobthorn tree. but he doesn't have that distinctive crest. So, other brown eagles, you can help me out here, everybody. Tawnies, perhaps booted, but that's much too uniformly colored for a booted. Lesser spotted and step. Now, it's not a tawny because it's too cleanly feathered. It doesn't have sort of mottling. It looks too finely done. They always look scruffy, tawny eagles. 
But it could be a lesser spotted eagle, which is quite interesting, except it's not really spotted at all. I think it's a Wahlberg's. But that crest is just not there. Of course, what we'll have to do is drive up underneath it, and it will eventually then fly and show us. There's a little bit of a crest. Okay, let's drive a little bit forward. Those wild dogs, everybody, have headed west. They look like they're going to cross into the Manuleti drift. Mm. Yeah, I don't know that that was a Wahlberg's, you know. It didn't have a very thin tail. Let me just go quickly around the corner here. Every instinct in my body is telling me it was a Wahlberg's, but my mind is saying, but it didn't have a skinny tail. You can still see it. Um, well, I got a glimpse of it. In fact, it's going to be, it's not going to be worth it. All right, let's carry on. Let's go with Wahlberg's Eagle, everybody, and if somebody's got a much better idea, send it through. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv, and we will discuss it from there. Still keeping an ear to the radio, just in case those dogs do change direction. Now, somebody on Twitter with an almost unrepeatable name, uh, Schmuck, you think that... <laughs> you think that it's a lesser spotted eagle. Well, Mr. Schmuck, let's, uh, let's have a look in the book and we'll decide whether you're correct or not or whether you are indeed just a schmuck. <laughs> Here are the two birds set next to each other. There's the lesser spotted. Now, I, I, I don't know that sh schmuck is entirely incorrect. They have got very stovepipe legs, you can see. Stovepipe fe feathering on the legs. And then they don't have a distinctive crest on the back. But they do often, the underwing tends to have a bit of a, more of a, a sort of darkness behind than the Wahlbergs, which has a pale behind. So that would be the way to tell uh, if we could see that thing again west. and make it fly. That announcement on the radio was the dogs crossing west Coffee, into the Manuleti game reserve. Right, so Schmuck, yeah, it could have been a lesser spotted. Thank you for that. I, have we heard from you before, Sh Schmuck? I'm not sure that we have. I think I'd remember that. I think I'd definitely remember somebody called Schmuck. <laughs> before I fall out of the car laughing, let's go across to Jamie. She's got some elephants. <laughs> on our way towards the wild dogs. Now, I've just had a report from Yes, boy, you're very scary. Okay. Calm down. It's all right. Just had a report from Taxon that the wild dogs have crossed into Manuleti from Sydney's Dam. But you never know. They might decide to change their direction, so I still plan on checking there. There's also apparently a very large buffalo herd that's finally made their way down. And now that our eddies have relaxed a little bit, I'm going to try and just sneak backwards so you can have a look at the youngest member of this herd. Let's try and get a view. Okay, guys. Calm down. It's all right. Little bulls are causing chaos. There we go. Tiny little one. Little female. And I think... No, it's not. I thought for a second it was the female with the snared trunk. It's not. All right, girl. Okay, big girl. I know you're keeping an eye on us. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not going to follow you. It's fine. You can chill. It was your boys that were causing trouble, not me. Yes. Lovely herd. Well, it's got a couple of what I would describe as teenage male elephants, sort of at the eight, nine, and ten-year-old mark, where they start to get a little bit cheeky. 
We've spoken about this yesterday as well. I think making themselves look big and scary, trying to throw their weight around. And the one gave us a solid trumpeting. That's upset that female ever so slightly. She's just keeping a close eye on us. And especially with a young baby and in this thick block, I'm not going to try and follow them. And we've spoken before about the elephants being a little bit more stressed at this time of year, although it's nice cool weather, which always works to our advantage. But the breeding herds having to cover huge distances or at least larger distances to find water for themselves. And that combined with increased, not pressure from big males, but definitely an increased presence of big male elephants is also, I think, cause them a little bit of anxiety. We're not going to try and follow this elephant herd. I think they're on their way to Galago Pan. We could have a nice sighting somewhere there. Or, at this point, they could either go towards Galago or they could go towards Sydney's. We can check both. Pushing their way. You can see there's the little one. A couple of months old, already stable on its feet. It's not a new, new calf doesn't have that wobbly, slightly pinkish, fuzzy look to it. Awesome. I think let's go to Sydney's Dam. Those wild dogs can be so indecisive about where they want to go. Taxon's given me the update. They've gone into Manuleti and then west from there, but you said they kept changing their minds. Hopefully they decided to change their minds and come back to where we can watch them. Jigger and Rusty are more than up to the task, as James Richard said, or doubted that maybe they wouldn't be able to stand up to another wild dog sighting. I'm sure they'll be fine. And Brent can be on the back of the vehicle for a change while we go racing around and he goes bouncing up and down. Just doing a bit of windscreen wiping. It is drizzling ever so slightly. And when we come up to this open patch, we'll have a look at the horizon and just see whether any of that rain looks like it's going to come in our direction. Ow, bug and I. That actually made an audible thump. <laughs> Ow. It's fine. I wasn't using my right eye anyway. It's quite okay. <laughs> Here we go. There's definitely a heavier feel to the air. And it really is. It's actually really starting to drizzle. As you can see. You might need to do a little bit of another windscreen wipe. It looks as though it might be setting in. And I think if it gets any harder, it might be rain cover time. What do you think? I think we might need to put on our rain cover soon. It is coming in coming in from the northwest. Yeah. And that, and that as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, Brett, as far as I know, that usually means it's gonna set in for a little while. Could be. What did you think? Yeah, that looks fairly heavy. I think we're going to have to put our rain cover on. And I would advise James to consider doing the same. As you can see, we are enjoying the wonderful scent of the rain in the African bush. And what an incredible smell that is. It's indescribable. Petrichor is the official term. While I put my rain cover on, let's find out what James is up to, and I'll catch up with you very shortly. I am um, astonished by what I've just heard. Uh, you've come across to us because Jamie needs to put on a rain cover. No rain? It's been a really interesting feature of this year's weather is that the showers have been so amazingly isolated. She's not far from us. I mean, she can't be more. I think she's around Sydney's Dam, which is, as the crow flies, probably about three or four kilometers. So really not far at all. We haven't had a drop. But very nice for the little area around Sydney's Dam, that there's a little bit of rain there. Maybe one or two grass shoots will come up as a result be inundated with animals looking for fresh grazing. 
now that it's stopped on her side, I hear. Yeah, no, certainly no rain this end. I think there's obviously a black cloud following over Jamie. She's had to go home to get a jersey. It's not raining on her. Must have got out of bed the wrong side. Right, well, I'll tell you where we are. We're in the far east, driving down the cheetah cut line, looking for a Singapore noodle stand. It's my latest joke, which I'll probably repeat five or six times before realizing it's not funny. Um, Jenny in Florida, you want to know about baobab trees and whether we get them here. There is a raptor. See it there, Brian? Yep. Beautiful. Look at that. What is that? Now, what is that, everybody? I can tell exactly what that is. Phew, that's a relief now. Why are we looking at that bird and you can tell me what you think it is? I must just quickly throw Kirsten under the bus here. The last person we were th talking to is not, in fact, Mr. Schmuck, but Mr. Schmutz. I don't know what a schmutz is, or if it is a thing, indeed. But uh, of course, I must apologize. You are not Mr. Schmuck, but Mr. Schmutz. And you identify that other bird as a lesser spotted eagle and not a Wahlbergs. I think you may well be right. Now, the reason I called you Mr. Schmuck was not to insult you, of course, but because I failed to understand Kirsten's pronunciation. Of course, because Kirsten cannot defend herself at this stage, I'm going to throw her under the bus. Now, that is a very clearly identifiable bird. And what it was, was a, Brian? Grey-headed sparrow? Potentially. No, that no, was a grey-headed sparrow. It was very obviously a step buzzard. Two very distinctive markings there. One was the yellow feet, unfeathered to the bottom, and the other, of course, was that very distinctive change in the striping and spotting that happens on the belly region of the step buzzard. And let me show you a picture. There we go. He's that bird there. And you can see it's spotted down to midway down the chest and then striped. So barring underneath and striping at the top. You can see the very clear line, and I just noticed that peeping out from behind the branch there. And so I'm very confident that that was a step or common buzzard. Buto Butio Vulpinus. That's quite a nice name. Butio Butio Vulpinus. Fails to learn the Latin names of birds. I don't think I'm going to lose any sleep over that or indeed spend any time doing it. But uh, Butio Butio Valpinus is a very nice name. Wouldn't be surprised to hear people calling their children um, Butio Butio Valpinus. Right, now, Jenny, you want to know about baobab trees? Um, baobab trees, Jenny, do not occur exactly where we are here. We're a little bit too far south. They do occur in Hoodsprate, or sort of around Hoodsprate in small numbers, which isn't too far from here. That's about, as the crow flies, probably about 50 kilometers to the northwest. But then north of that, they start to occur in much larger profusion. But even up until probably about 100 kilometers north of that, they're fairly sparse. And then you really start to find lots of baobab trees as we go north into the northern reaches of the Limpopo province and into Zimbabwe, of course. So no baobab trees here. The southernmost naturally occurring baobab that I know of is in the Timbavati, which is about 50 k's north of here. And that was on a, that's on a farm called the Giraffe Farm. And I remember, actually, it was the first baobab tree I ever saw. And my father and I were walking through the bush one day, and we were not very bush people at all. We didn't understand the dangers of the wild. I was probably about 12, 
And my dad, I don't remember how old he was, but we were just wandering through the bush there one afternoon while the rest of the family was having a snooze. And we came across this huge tree. And I remember climbing it. I think we both climbed it, actually. I probably did a bit more climbing in it. And that was one of the first trees that I really started to... One of the first times that I really enjoyed climbing a tree, and that is the southernmost baobab, naturally occurring baobab that I think there is in the country. So there's a little nostalgic story for you while we drive along the cheetah cut line in the far east, hoping for tracks perhaps of leopard, cheetah, or any other kind of predator that might be heading across this way. At the moment, it is very clear of any tracks. Hello, Rich Levy. You're in Chicago, and basically you're asking a very valid question. Any cheetah on Cheetah Cut Line, or was it named after Cheetah Plains? Not named after Cheetah Plains. I, I mean, most of the roads here were just given names. You know, that you often find a hyena road, or a waterbuck road, or an impala road, simply because you need a name when you make, it, make a place. There, I have seen a cheetah on Cheetah Cut, cut Line before. I think because of this big fire break here, you can see it's much clearer on the left-hand side of the road than it is on the right, and that's been physically cleared in order to make way for a fire break. It's completely superfluous at this stage, but after a particularly wet season, a fire break is very necessary in this area. And so, I, you know, the cheetah will like this kind of open area without the bush in it. It just makes it easier for them to hunt, easier for them to see. And, you know, if you're running at 60 miles an hour, across the plains. You don't really want to be running through a woodland because you're liable to bash your head on something. So there have been cheetah around here. Gail, in Calgary, you ask a very interesting question. And I, I mean, it will be the same where you're from, and certainly the same in the States. You say, and in England, and I'm sure anywhere in the world, you say, are oh, there different kinds of South African accents, and can you hear where people are from? There are definitely different kinds of South African accents. Of course, we've got 11 official languages, so that immediately means that there are going to be at least 11 different kinds of accents. But amongst the English-speaking population, there are definitely different kinds of accents. I'm not really sure where mine comes from. You can certainly hear somebody from Cape Town when they speak. They basically sound like they've had a large dose of anesthetic, and they kind of speak at the very out tone like this. You know, they talk about their mountain and the sea and the beauty of nature that they have in their city. And then you have people from Natal, like Kirsten McLennan Smith, where the, um, the vowel I and U are used interchangeably. So you might say that you found a fush on the fridge, or that you were going to walk up the hull. Uh, that's very common from the Natal regions. I'm getting shouted at through my ear, of course at this stage. And then, of course, you get, like, the accent from the south of Joburg. You know, if you're in Johannesburg and you're quite a tough guy, you like to go to the gym quite a lot and have a drink with the boys on a Friday night, this is how you kind of talk. Come to the bush, check out the animals, yeah, yeah, and you say things like yeah and yeah, and, and you also say hey at the end of every sentence. So you say, did you check those, did you check those war dogs, eh? That's a very really nice way to speak if you're quite a tough guy. Uh, and so those are the different kinds of accents that we get here. Now, before I get myself into a lot more trouble, let's go across to Jamie. She's got a large herd of bovines, and I'll catch up with you later. James demonstrating his penchant for different accents and voices. We've arrived at Sydney's dam. No wild dogs, but a couple of hundred-odd buffalo will do instead. It's one of my favorite things about the settings, setting at Sydney's Dam, this wide open space. You can observe everything coming and going and get a much broader overview than we often get of something like a buffalo herd. Lots of them already finished their drink, but some arriving. Making their way down towards the dam. I see a couple of little calves also within this herd, so keep your eyes peeled. 
the buffalo have had their new babies of the season, or a few of them have. Keep your eyes peeled for new and wobbly calves, and the thirsty buffalo rushing right in to Sydney's dam, up to their chests, for a good thirst-quenching drink. Accompanied by their usual entourage of oxpeckers fluttering about them. And I'm glad we're here because there's a little one. Not that tiny, but definitely one of the new calves of the, of the wet season. And I'm glad that we're here because you never know what might come wandering around. And I'm sure that those, there's a good chance those wild dogs will change direction. Taxon said he thought that maybe this enormous herd of buffalo might have discouraged them, or as James would descri describe it, a giant herd of buffalo. In this case, fully justified. A couple of hundred, I would say. 300 or so odd buffalo, maybe more. There's still more arriving. Lovely to see these breeding herds. Uh, Brent and I actually started our morning with a couple of buffalo wandering towards the dam, and it was a mixture of females and young sub-adults. We speculated because they were looking incredibly nervous and with a group of only, I think there were probably about seven or eight of them, there was a good chance that these buffalo herds had been harassed by lions at some point during the evening, separating that initial group from the rest of the herd. And that's nice. I think they're going to choose to come wandering across in our direction. And this Larpa, absolutely. It has been a wonderful, productive dam. This Larpa was saying that Sydney's has been, oh, the calls of the buffalo. There's a young calf that's going to start wandering through soon. Here we go. Hello, little one. What would that be, about a month or so old? Maybe two? No, I think about a month old. Cute, they look so disproportionate compared to the adults. This Larpa, absolutely. This dam has been pumped full of game recently. Access to one of the main bodies of water that is remaining and hasn't dried up makes it a perfect thoroughfare for animals like elephants and buffalo. And of course, when we get lucky, wild dogs sprinting through as well. I know that we've chatted before about wild dog prey selection and the fact that they target mainly in the Kruger area. They target mainly in Parliament. In fact, bless you. Mm -hmm. you buffalo making you sneeze. <laughs> um, so in the Kruger area, buffalo, um, impala will be the main source of, and I think in some areas it's about 80% of a wild dog's diet, but in areas where there are enormous packs of 40 dogs strong, they have been recorded to take on buffalo calves, although faced with a barrier of horns, I certainly want to, wouldn't want to tackle that particular female with those widespread horns, or any of them actually. And as you know, buffalo can be incredibly defensive in chasing off predators away from their calves and away from their youngsters. That lion hunt that we witnessed the other day being the perfect example with an old female coming back, risking her life to attempt to save the sub-adult that the Unkahuma pride had caught. So if the wild dogs were to wander through here, there is a chance, as we often see with animals like waterback, wildebeest and zebra, that they would be quite thoroughly chastised and chased away. Although it was interesting yesterday, not sorry, not yesterday, it was the day before yesterday. I've got just had too many wild dog sightings, I can't keep track. Um, but yesterday with the wild dogs, the investic pack Impala settled. Impala going, 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 like they've been chased by dogs this way. So they come, Impala they're coming this way. the buffalo at high speed. Awesome. Okay, things just up to pace a little bit. Frantically running Impala. Which side did they come through? The back? From behind the dam wall through that gap there. Come on, wild dogs. Come pay us a visit. Oh, this could be exciting. Keep your eyes peeled. See if you can spot the dogs before Brent and myself. If you could spot them before Brent, I will be very impressed. Come on, dogs. Couple of little calves. 
as we were saying, wild dogs will target, can take on little calves. I'd be very, very surprised though if the packs of, our, of the size that we have at the moment would go and even try it. The buffalo are fairly relaxed on this side at least, wandering south towards us and as you know, not just the possibility of wild dogs coming down the dam wall, there's always a chance that lion prides are going to wander through. They very often tail big buffalo herds such as this one. Wandering back north over the dam wall. Come Here come the Impala. That's ex and they're doing that starting jump that is so typical of Impala being chased and once they've got to a point at which they feel a bit safer, look how alert they are. I'm almost certain that was the wild dogs that chased them across here. Oh, so close and yet so far. Come on, dogs. This way. There's food this way. Come and join us. Look at the body language of the Impala. The head's moving everywhere. And when I refer to stotting, Impala do these spectacular, almost handstand-like leaps where they throw their back legs up into the air. A buffalo have decided they've caught up with the atmosphere and decided to jog away from the dam. Just reverse, reverse, so you can see how the dam Look at that, there's a There's a as well. Here we go, stampede coming. Something startled them. I'm going to reverse back a little bit. I couldn't see anything chasing the Inyala. But they've also been... There's the dogs. There they go. Yes! Awesome! Racing after the Inyala. Hey, we got lucky again. Come on, this way, dogs. I should just stop here. I want to try and determine which way they're going to go. Dust flying everywhere, buffalo sprinting away in a panic, automatically picking up on the racing in Yala and running away just for the sake of it. In a sort of herd-like instinct. Where's that wild dog gone? There the rest of the pack. Coming over. Oh, there they are on the damn wall. How lucky are we? Yes! Good call coming to Sydney's dam and deciding to. Sorry, guys. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Well done. Well done, Brent. Doing, a, doing superb work. Getting excited with wild dogs. Dog on it. Awesome! I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> Don't apologize. It's fine. The rest of the pack, I'm going to leave. I'm going to try and keep up with this dog. Buffalo in my way. Let's try and catch them around on the slip road, off-road track that we saw them last time. No buffalo. I need to come through here. Excuse me. Excuse me. Then. Off you go. Buffalo racing away from the sprinting in Yala. They don't really know what's chasing it. So they're automatically feeling threatened. Towards access. Towards access. So I'd rather take access rather than this. Yeah, go around. Okay. Okie dokie. Let's go. Awesome, awesome, exciting stuff. Let's loop around here. Yeah. That's coming through, might be easier to stay with him. We're there. Now oh, you've got both Brent and myself on one vehicle chasing wild dogs. This could be a thoroughly entertaining experience. Here they are. Awesome. Hello, guys. A buffalo were in a flat panic. There was just one wild dog on that Inyala. I only saw the one coming through. Uh, I would say the chances of one solitary wild dog taking down an Inyala bull, what did you say, Bryn? Possible. The Inyala looked tired. It did look exhausted. And that, of course, is the magic of wild dogs, that endless, boundless stamina. Chasing animals to the point that they get what's known as chase myopathy. 
muscles and their heart just cannot keep up with the demands that their body and the chase is exerting from them. Hello, guys. All those big ears looking, at, looking across at us. Stations, I've got the Madach here at Sydney's Dam. <laughs> and that one bark coming from a dog in a garden woofing at the wild dogs. Now, the dogs out here are incredibly well trained, but I think, imagine trying to demand it of them. The, here comes the one adult. Now, keeping up with a wild dog on the hunt is, especially with one vehicle, is next to impossible, which is why we're staying with the rest of the pack. We'll be able to follow them. If that wild dog does take down the Inyala, it will call to the rest of the pack members. And they'll relocate, and they'll all start to feed. It'll be easier for us to follow the entire pack rather than try and keep up with a dog chasing an Inyala. Hello. Thank you very much for changing your mind. That was very considerate of you. A tatty-eared adult. All of them, though, have tatty ears. Which pack would this be in It's uh... It's hard to... It's so hard to tell at this distance. It looks as though we might have... The rest of the pack they are coming through, trotting through. How lucky have we been with wild dog sightings? This is epic. Sydney's dam once again proving to be a lucky spot. Nope, going back to have a, might possibly to have a drink. Apologies for my camel work, I got a little bit too excited. <laughs> Brent becomes a wild dog when he sees wild dogs and gets distracted and excited. <laughs> At least you spotted that one. I didn't even see it coming behind us. Brent's camera work is absolutely fine. I don't think you're going to be I having any complaints. I think James is being very nice about my camera work. <laughs> I don't think you're going to have any complaints. You... Don't worry. <laughs> there we go. Blair Witch Project. It has been about a year since I used to come. <laughs> it, it has been a while since Brent last had to operate one of these cameras. The wild dogs walked off screen, Brent. Yes, I'm looking at the other ones here. <laughs> Kirsty's just described it as the Blair Witch Project. I think that's un I don't think that's fair. I think you're doing fantastic work. Let's see if I can keep up to Brent's standards of keeping up with wild dogs. That will be the next test of this sighting. There's another one that's come to have a look. They are all going to come across in this direction. We've just got a brief lull in the excitement of the morning. And perhaps it might be a good idea to have James around as well. I'm not sure if he's on his way or not. Brilliant. He is on his way. James is coming to join us. And hopefully with two vehicles, we'll be able to keep up with the wild dogs. And I'm just going to contact James on the Game Drive channel to get, suggest which direction he should come in. James for Jamie. What's your position? Okay, copy, perfect. Um, the one dog chasing Nyala in that direction, so just keep an eye out around the access road. Come straight up access, sorry, my earpiece is playing up, straight up access. Watching the buffalo intently. And there's these moments with wild dog sightings that it's almost, compared to their high energy chases, it's almost a frozen tableau of the wild dogs looking about in anticipation, waiting for something to change. I'm going to go back a little bit because they can come out here. Reversing skills are not up to par there. I'm not sure, I can't hear James clearly, but I think he might have found one of them at Sandy Patch Junction, Voyatella. 
confirm you've got one of the dogs there? Okay, copy. Um, if you can, rather take uh, voyeurs all the way up to the gate. Here we go. Whole pack rushing across. And Buffalo looking on with bemused interest. This could be fascinating. I wonder if they're going to decide to chase them or if they don't think that they're too much of a threat. Sniffing away. All right. Time to go. As I said, there are those brief moments, those brief lulls in action. There's that little buffalo calf staring across at us. Sorry, little one, can't stop. Wild dogs to follow. around oh what are they mm. a piece of plastic is what they've got we'll rescue that later is it a pair of old shorts it is it is a pair of old shorts that's an interesting interesting sighting at least it's not plastic a pair of old shorts is not going to do them serious damage or is it? Can you chase them up it or not? No, yeah, it'll be okay. <laughs> Just a game of tug of war. It's like domestic dogs. And just to give James some instructions, we've just come opposite Candace's house, the Sabi Sands management house, and close to the quarry. We're moving past the quarry towards where Teller made access. Come straight up main access road towards the gate would be the best approach. You naughty creatures. It is a pair, it's either a pair of shorts or an old t-shirt that they've managed to collect. <laughs> what you up to? I'm so naughty. Is that a great game? Tug of war. With a piece of rag. You can hear James racing in. Oh, no, that's another vehicle. <laughs> you guys don't need to worry. That's not going to do any damage to them. You've seen what wild dogs are capable of ingesting. They're not going to... Okay, perfect. James is caught up with the rest of the adults. We've got a massive game of <laughs> tug of war. Dogs having an absolute ball with whatever they've managed. I think it's a piece of rag or cloth. Overalls. Could be overalls. Could well be overalls. Playing like puppies, which is, in a way, exactly what they are. That's one of the things that I think Brent and myself both love the most about wild dogs. Their playfulness. The way that they keep themselves entertained with anything that they can find, from elephant dung to sticks to hyena scat. And while they tug away, James is caught up with the rest of the pack, so let's find out what they're... Well, what a stroke of a magnificent luck. There's another one coming now from the right-hand side. In fact, the whole pack is coming through. And with any luck, they're going to start greeting each other right here. The whole pack's coming right this way. We stopped just on the road here to try and fix the VR rig, which is destroyed at this stage. And the whole pack is now coming straight past us. What a magnificent stroke of luck that is. They are just the best, these things. I'm so excited by this. We've had such incredible luck with dogs over the last few days. It does not happen very often. Well, it does seem to happen to us quite often. We're very lucky that way. Isn't that wonderful? And we've, of course, been very lucky, unlike poor old Jamie, who's had to drive through the thick thickness of the bush.
try and get a picture of them. There they go. Beautiful little couple coming behind us now. Wonderful. And there they go. And they're unfortunately going to cross straight onto Simbambili at this stage. So let me just try and get around here. We've had an incredible view of them, everybody, so I'm not going to drive too quickly after them. But there they go, running through the block. This pack is now mobile in a southwesterly direction towards Triple M. Probably going to cross on to uh, Zimbabwe. Okay, let's go quickly back across to Jamie. Right, Jamie's just in front of us. The dogs are looking towards her. The rest of the pack is heading down south and east towards them. Wonderfully, they are still on the Vuitella. They're very close, of course. There they go. They're very close to crossing onto Simbambili. Very close by here. There they seem to be now intent on doing some kind of a chase. It is going to get very thick through here, everybody. So hold on tight. Watch your head. Don't spill your drinks. Here we go. Let's head back across to Jamie. She's got the rest of the pack. Caught up with the dogs. Believe it or not. There we go. There's one. The rest of them are raced towards power lines, which is where James is. They're definitely on the hunt. James is also here, and we've got the rest of the pack coming through behind us. Extraordinary animals. That constant ability. I would love to measure how fast they run, or how far they run, not how fast they run, how far they run in just one of these little mornings, with us dashing backwards and forwards trying to catch up with them. It's never in a straight line. Look at that. They've turned around. Going straight back the way they came, there's the rest of the pack there. And while we catch up with them and try and loop around, let's pop over to James's vehicle. Brilliant stuff. They've turned east again now, so we'll keep following them. At least west, sorry. They're heading back towards the boundary. But just wonderful to have them all dotted about the clearing here, jogging slowly. And they're jogging, of course, only because they haven't spotted anything to chase yet. And should they come across something, they will go at a great speed. It's a youngster that looks like a, a yearling, or not quite a yearling, but one brought from this year, born this year. This pack is probably going to cross over now, I'm afraid. Yeah, they're crossing the boundary. Beautiful sight of it there. Oh, they're crossing onto Simbambili. They're going down what's known as One Eye Pan Road, where I ended up by mistake the other day. 
Hold on, Brian. Hold on, everybody. Don't spill. They're chasing each other, and I'm afraid, everybody, that's it. <laughs> what a wonderful, wonderful sighting. There are two left on the road. There are two left on the road there. Let's just quickly go towards them. We can get a nice view of them as they cross. But there they go. Yeah, that's going to be the last view that we get of them. Ah, oh, just so special. Wonderful. Brian, that's a lovely shot. Look at it running through the woodland there. It's dappled coat. Obviously a brilliant camouflage in this shader. Ah, oh, wow. What a magnificent, magnificent treat for the morning, hey? He was, I feel very, uh, very calm now. In fact, it's very kind of privileged to have seen that. I think I'm probably feeling calm because they've, of course, headed up onto a place where I can't follow them through the thick woodland, so I know that it's not going to be a... Anyway, marvellous. All righty, on we go. What a very, very special thing to see again. We have had some incredible wild dog sightings here. I can't remember. You know, I worked at Londolosi for a long time, which is just to the south of us. I worked at Ngala to the north of us for a long time. We didn't have wild dog sightings like we have here. And I think it's much like with the lions, it's like with the lions and the leopards. There seems to be a kind of real meeting of edges of home ranges and territories. And I think because of that, we have an unusually high number of wild dog sightings here. Very special indeed. It might be worth hanging around this road for a little while. I know Jamie is just standing by on the road there to see if they don't come out. They may well just go to one Eye Pan and have a drink and come out again, but I'm not sure. So I'll keep going down the road here. And then we'll go sort of round in a loop towards the north. While we're doing that, sit back to Jamie. She'll tell you what her plan's going to be. And I'll catch up with you just now. Well, that was a very rapid, very nice surprise from our side. And the dogs, we're just sitting right where the dogs disappeared off into Simabili, just in case they decide to come back in. Wild dogs are a wild ride. What an awesome experience and so exciting to have both Brent and myself on one vehicle, getting overly excited about wild dogs. I think they're probably moving further into Simbabiri. I heard an elephant trumpeting away further into the block. I have left the other vehicles on Simbabiri know over the radio so that if they want to, they can follow up and they probably will. They'll follow up and if we, if they do decide to cross back into Arethusa, for example, where we could go and do them, then we'll change our route plan and head across that side. Brent's experience. I think he had a quite a short, easy experience sitting on the back with the wild dogs. It's not a prolonged chase, but Brent doing an extraordinary job of keeping up with him. He is less impressed with himself. Clear which dog project. Okay, fair enough. I have to confess. Ooh. Okay, let's just get off this road and then I'll start talking again. Here we go. I have to confess, I wouldn't know where to begin with camera work, particularly if a wild dog sighting happened to appear. And I think, in fact, if I were on camera this morning, I would probably be secretly hoping for no rapid moving sightings. So something like a herd of buffalo I might be able to manage. And I'm heading back towards that direction. I want to see what they're up to now and if they've relaxed at all. That, one of those magical moments where they come screeching across. 
I love sightings like that. And then playing with a piece of cloth, just like puppies might do. They didn't eat it, they dropped it and left it as soon as the rest of the pack ran off. We drove past, it looked like a piece of overall. It had an almost a canvassy texture to it. As I said, a great game for all concerned. One massive wild dog tug of war, five of them or six of them pulling in opposite directions. So I hope you got some good screenshots because I'm sure that Brent was itching to reach for his camera. And I probably as what I should have done. Let's pick it up. But yes, please send us through your wonderful screenshots. And on that subject, just while I remember, thank you to everyone. Myself and the Ellie. disappeared a little bit on you and I was in the middle of just saying thank you for those of you who jumped on board and were good sports and superimposed that image of me next to the elephant I'm actually quite curious to see just how much I think you only get a perspective of close a little bit juddery are we all in in one piece. Yesterday afternoon, Rusty's aerial dropped off. Whether or not that was connected to the presence of wild dogs on the property or There's never a buffalo to begin with. Let's go have a look. Right, here we are at the buffalo, everybody. This is a different herd of buffalo that you saw earlier. This one has come straight across from Arethusa onto Juma or Vuyatela or Western Gari, depending on what your particular event is. About 7,000 different names or four properties out here. Anyway, what it means is we can view them. They're on our property, which is fantastic. It looks like a very small herd of buffalo but there are lots of them through the woodland here. They're all grazing through here, possibly heading towards the Juma Pan. This slightly strange place for buffalo to look at this one sitting, poking the head up over the top. That's a cow. You can see she's a cow because she's got very dainty horns, very skinny. very strange coincidence it seems as though James and myself have both drifted accidentally into separate problem signal areas one of those little challenges of live safaris is every now and again you hit a bit of a black hole hello Impala how are you feeling after that morning shock still a little bit on edge I think it's just males doing their thing. I thought we were about to go on another mad wild dog dash. I don't really want to leave the area, just in case the wild dogs decide to come back. You can see how on alert the Impala are. Hearts racing, I imagine, after a wild dog chase. It's interesting, we've spoken a lot about this. Yesterday we chatted about alarm calls, and what animals will pay attention to which type of alarm calls. With wild dogs, that doesn't even enter into the equation. There isn't a sound from the animals they chase. They just run. They run for their lives. 
I know James had that extraordinary sighting with either the world's luckiest or the world's smartest impala. Where she ran straight ahead of the wild dogs and then ducked behind, lay down behind a bush, and the wild dogs went straight past her after the rest of the herd. And as with all predators, most of their hunting vision is movement-based. So she had a very, very lucky escape. I think she was tired, she was heavily pregnant at the time. She just decided to adopt that tactic, which worked exceptionally well in her case. I'm going to do a loop around to see if I can see any sign of the dogs coming back. Maybe, as Brent said, there was a chance they killed that Nyala. While I do that, James is caught up with our buffalo that were previously in Sydney's dam. Right. Here we are with, still with our herd of buffalo. I'm sorry you lost signal there. We're not really sure why or what happened there. I think it's got quite a lot to do with the bumpy road that is the triple M break. Anyway, the beefalo are heading in a gentle easterly direction. Now, yesterday we had a wonderful sighting. Well, I had a wonderful sighting on my own, actually, of this, I think probably this herd of buffalo drinking from the Juma Dam pan. And it was about 250 of them on the clearing there. That was wonderful to see. And I'm pretty sure that this is the same herd. They've probably been off for the night at Arethusa. They would may well have drunk there during the night and then they've grazed this way during the morning. Right. Now, Jeffrey, you were in, well, you were and you still are in Austin, and you clearly heard my calling in of the giant herd of buffalo that I found yesterday. That was this herd. And then, of course, nobody came to see my giant herd of buffalo, which was 250 strong. And when you arrived at the sighting, there were three buffalo bulls there, and now everyone cast dispersions on me and uh, made mention of the fact that I was exaggerating. 250 is still not a giant herd, but it is fairly large. So, Jeffrey, thank you for that. Thank you for reminding me. I just got so excited that I called in on the radio without thinking stations there is a giant herd of buffalo at the Juma Dam Pan. This one is gargantuan. Donna, nice question. We've just seen the wild dogs, of course, <clears throat> clearly on the hunt. You want to know if they'd ever go after a buffalo calf? Not in this area. I've never, well, it's unlikely in this area. In East Africa, I know that they eat quite a lot in the way of wildebeest, and I suspect, therefore, that if they can create a stampede in a herd like this, and separate a calf out from the herd, they might try and go for it. It would be unlikely though, and that's because this herd will become very protective of any animal that is, or any of their number that is threatened. And the dogs will be pretty easy to chase off. So unless, unless the dogs actually manage to kill a calf on the run, so kind of disembowel it as they're running along, then I think it would be unlikely, certainly not impossible, and I'm pretty sure it has happened. I've never seen it happen around here, though. And even the, even the wildebeest, the dogs are pretty nervous of around these parts. Impala, Stienbock, Dyke tend to be the things that they eat the most of. We drive quite a lot slow, slower around the buffalo herds than we do around the wild dog packs, I find. Now, Jim in, term, <coughs> Jim in California, excuse me, <coughs> I've got some buffalo dust in my throat. You want to know why is this a breeding herd? What is the terminology? What's the different terminology? Jim, a breeding herd is just simply the herd that contains the females, the cows, and the bulls. In the case of the buffalo, there will be bulls. In the case of an elephant breeding herd, it's just cows and calves. The, it's used interchangeably with herd of buffalo. I just call it a breeding herd of buffalo because that's, I suppose, the more accurate term. 
but if you were to call it a herd of buffalo, as opposed to a breeding herd, there would be no difference in what you meant. They are not distinct social groupings. Same with elephants. In terms of impala, we might refer to a nursery herd, which would be the ewes and their lambs, a bachelor herd, which would be the, obviously the bachelors. But I suppose, strictly speaking, a breeding herd, well, no. A breeding herd ideally would contain all members of the breeding party, so bulls and cows and youngsters. But we do refer to breeding herd of elephants, even though they don't contain any bulls in them. Very nice breeding herd here. I think they'll probably go to ground fairly soon to chew their cud and then maybe move on during the course of the day. Brian and I are not convinced about this rain, you know. We haven't, we've found no rain, have we, Brian? No. Yeah, none. Nothing at all. is a pity. Hmm. Hello, Pam Shirley. Very valid question. We were talking about whether the wild dogs would eat them. The lions certainly would eat a buffalo. Where are they, you want to know? As far as I know, I heard vague reports of the Nkuhuma pride somewhere around Torchwood this morning maybe in coral. The Birmingham boys, I think, are probably in Mala Mala. I haven't heard count of them for some time. Talamati Pride. And there was another pride, actually, the Talamati Pride, and an, I think it was called the, it's called the Manileti Pride, was in Manileti yesterday. So nothing on Little's Hook. So basically, nothing on Voyatella at the moment. Of course, don't forget, if you were a guest of Voyatella or Gallagher camps, which are the Juma camps, um, you would be able to go on to just about all of those properties that I've mentioned, and so you would see lions. But we, our signal doesn't extend that far, so we don't have lions here at the moment. I'm not sad about that. I'll tell you why. I'm not sad about it, A, because it means all the wildebeest are surviving, and I think that's quite nice. And B, because I find that, yes, lions are magnificent animals and I enjoy spending time with them, but I find that when they are in the middle of the day and they're not hunting or doing something, I don't find them as entertaining as many of the other animals around here. I don't find them nearly as entertaining as buffalo, for example. And while they are, of course, quintessential part of what we do here. I am more than happy to drive around and look at the birds and the buffalo and the wildebeest and the impala and diker and stienbrook and all those sorts of things rather than lions if they happen to be lying about the place doing absolutely nothing. You can see easily there how the horns come out of the side of the, of the skull. John, a fascinating question. We, you can see an ox pecker there on the back of that cow. And you want to know, is that relationship symbiotic? In other words, does one and one make more than two? Is there a benefit to both creatures? for that relationship that occurs between oxpeckers and some of the mammals. John, for a long time, we thought absolutely it was a completely symbiotic relationship. There are certainly some elements of research to suggest that that isn't the case, to suggest that perhaps the buffalo don't derive quite as much from the relationship as the birds do, especially when they keep wounds open and they may allow for wounds to fester. I think they do more of a cleaning job, to be honest. But I think you'll find that, depending on the health of the buffalo, the relationship probably does tip towards, slightly towards parasitism on the side of the birds, certainly in some cases. But I don't think to the extent that it's damaging 
or particularly damaging or hazardous to the host species. So I would say largely symbiotic, tending towards parasitic. <laughs> Hello, Carol. You ask a very valid question. We're constantly telling you about the Duggar boys, the old bull buffaloes, who, when they get tired of moving around with the herd, they go and sit by a pan somewhere and have a relaxed retirement. You want to know if the cows do the same thing. No, they don't, Pam. The cows stay with the herd until the day that they either drop dead from exhaustion or until a lion catches them and eats them. Now, they're running like this because the wind has just changed. It's come from behind us and they can smell us now. So even though they have very sharp eyes and they can see us, the smell of Brian's aftershave is really making them upset. That is not uncommon. I'm being facetious, of course. It's not got anything to do with Brian's aftershave at all. It's got everything to do with the fact that their brains, much like ours, interpret smell in a very emotional way. And I've no doubt that all of you watching have had memories conjured up by a, a familiar smell. And I think the same thing goes for buffalo and any of the animals out here. When they smell human, they immediately are overcome with the emotion of fear and they run. Right, on that slightly somber note, we are going to bid you a fond farewell. Thank you, Brian, for your Thank efforts you. today. I'm glad your nose is no longer plugged mm. with three kilometers of blue paper. What a relief. There is the thumb. The thumb did not get hay fever today. Thank you, Kirsten and Jerry. We'll hand you back to Jamie and her new cameraman, Brent Leo Smith, and we will see you this afternoon. Bye-bye. Finishing off our Hello, Sunrise Safari, where James essentially started his with the hyena at Galago Pan, where apparently they pulled a piece of the carcass out and quite possibly even dragged it back towards the den site. Here's another individual lying up on the other side of the pan, and they'll probably spend their day here alternating between napping and going to have a nice wallow in the pan itself. Is that the hyena with the injured neck? It is. The one with the injuries has been... Apparently, you guys saw it earlier at the den site. It's been nipped and bitten around the neck. They're not serious injuries, although they do look uncomfortable. It's incredible the way that they heal up and how all of the animals, not just hyena, are, show exceptional resilience to injuries that would, for us, get incredibly infected and become painful and uncomfortable. Wow, what an extraordinary morning it has been. Quite an interesting one from start to finish, what with Brent being on camera and I think doing a fantastic job considering he hasn't had to operate one of these cameras on the back of a vehicle for close to a year. I'm very, very impressed. And to then have to deal with a manic wild dog sighting, I still think it was excellent. But what an enjoyable morning. It just goes to show how patience and persistence can sometimes pay off out here, and very, very often usually does, sitting at Sydney's Dam just waiting in the hope that the dogs were going to change direction and come straight back to where we were before. It's an important lesson to remind us that the bush has so much to offer, and sometimes sitting in one place and sitting, listening, and watching is a good approach. That's one that the hyenas will be exceptionally familiar with. You don't survive if you're not a patient hyena, particularly with the lower ranking individuals. They need to play the submissive patient game. And hyenas will wait for ages around a carcass to have an opportunity to feed after the lions have moved off. Another extraordinary morning. Three wild dog sightings in a row now, I think that is. We haven't done too badly at all. Hopefully, this afternoon, they'll decide to pop back on for the sunset safari. You never know. Or we could get something else. One of the leopards 
And thank you all of you. I never finished my sentence. Thank you all of you for your screenshots. And thank you as well for joining us on the back of our safari vehicle. Your wonderful questions and comments as always are very much appreciated. Thank you to the lovely ladies in final control, Kirsty and Jerry, and to Eugene for the technical side. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world. We'll catch you this afternoon.